I'm just not to shut the door. You're being weird again. Get out of my room. It's my room too. Yes, I know she's at that age. I'm very aware of that. Thank you. Well, if you're such a parenting expert, why don't they come and live with you? Yeah, thought so. No, I know I was the one that left. No, no, look. Could you please do me this small favour? She, she's your daughter, Max. Hi, Dad. We have to go. I put it down. It glows when it's scared. How would you know? He's mine. Just because you caught it and put it in a jar doesn't mean it belongs to you. It's not it. It's Henry. Henry lives here now. Don't you, Henry? That's new. May I be excused? You haven't touched your meal. Food you can eat without teeth. My favorite. Sometimes I miss Dad's cooking. Sorry, Mum. Sometimes I do too. I've washed your uniforms for Monday. Excited? How are you feeling, Mum? It's like you said. There's no changing it. Can I please go now? Just eat. I don't feel well. Cramps? Gross. No, I just... I want to be alone. Oh, that's new for you. Oh, shut up till you moron. Molly! What? Don't speak to her like that. Sorry. Don't speak to me like that either. Oh, what, Mum? Do you have any manners? Do you even like me? Do you? Do you? I'm your mother, Molly. I'm not your friend. It doesn't matter if I like you. Power search detected. Is that Henry? everyone to assess the latest in-camera vfx toolset coming with the release of unreal engine 427 we teamed up with filmmakers collective bullet to create a test piece 
Venture over to the blog to watch the full film, which was shot entirely on Nance Studios' LED stage in LA, and then check out the first in a series of upcoming behind the scenes to learn more about how the team used our extensive suite of virtual production tools to create final pixels in just four days. Set your scenes with over 1,000 products, now 50% off during the July Marketplace sale. Instantly transport someone to another world or time with this month's deals including Aztec temples, cyberpunk diners, deadly forests with plenty of plugins, materials, templates, and more to get you on your way. Shop now through July 25th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Ready to learn something new? July's Unreal Online Learning courses are now available, designed with game developers in mind, but beneficial for anyone who wants to make an engaging experience, learn how to create a save game system, explore artist-based environment tools in depth, and dig into the components of gameplay. Head over to Unreal Online Learning to get started. And if you're a Cinema 4D user, be sure to check out our latest webinar on how to create motion graphics for broadcast using Unreal Engine and Cinema 4D. We covered file import, look development, control rig setup, and how to export it all with the Movie Render queue. Watch the full presentation on YouTube. 220 talented animators rose to meet the challenge set forth during the first ever 11 Second Club contest for Unreal Engine, the Animation Learning Challenge 2021. Equipped with one metahuman rig and 11 seconds of audio, these talented folks impressed us with their creativity and talent. Tobias Noller took home the grand prize with the short, You Took Me For A Fool. Go watch his and all the other fantastic entries. Now for this week's Top Karma Earners, many thanks to Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Lizard89, T. Sumisaki, Grimya, Raymond Bosch, Mickey, Chastifer543, Marlin, and Void. In our first spotlight, walk the path of a blind cyber samurai embarking on a journey of revenge. Explore Japanese folk tales in a sci-fi Edo period and discover a forgotten past in Blind Fate Edo no Yami by Troglobite Games. Wishlist Blind Fate on Steam. Next up, enjoy Swell, a thoughtful short about the social pressures of society and how we all travel through life with our own monsters. Great work by the team of eight animation students. Watch the full video on YouTube. And finally, check out Waco the Mask Gatherer, an action-adventure game created by a two-person dev team. Play as Waco, a mysterious gecko who collects powerful masks in an atmospheric world where you'll discover dark and disturbing secrets. Set to release the end of this year, you can wishlist Waco on Steam. Thanks for watching this week's news and Community Spotlight. Hey everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and today I would like to introduce Aaron McLaren, lead audio programmer. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, we're really excited. I don't know when the last time we were on the Unreal Engine live stream. It's got to be at least uh, over a year, definitely before the pandemic. Yeah, well, so. you've been on before, but Rob has not. So let me please yes. <laughs> let me introduce Rob Gay, Rob. Uh, senior okay, audio programmer. Going? Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Just kind of hanging out. Tagging yeah, along, that... talking about my favorite stuff here. So, thank you. We're, we're using Zoom, by the way, uh, which is kind of an exciting. <laughs> this is what we use every day for work. We just talk all the way through, so it was quite easy to just like, yeah, we'll just have a Zoom meeting live. Yeah, so... if, um, if you've tried to do audio um, on a <laughs> live stream ask similar before, it, it can get rather tricky. I don't know if anyone was watching the Mortal Shell live stream we did, but um, their audio designer was actually using two headsets to be able to. <laughs> One on each ear to be able to one one audio device for the the voice call and another for yep. the audio that he was piping oh, out yeah. to our service. Yeah, when we were meeting to prepare for this, we we had a more complicated setup, and we're like, let's just use Zoom. It works fine. So it's like a maybe the, <laughs> in the head for Zoom. We're using the original sound option on Zoom. So when we share a screen, you'll be able to hear everything in nice stereo, and it should sound good. Yeah, it should sound so, right. So. Uh, if you don't know, I'm the uh, lead audio programmer. I've been at Epic for six years now. Um, and uh, my 
ambition and dream uh, has been to make Unreal Engine Audio one of the best in games. Uh, and we started, uh, I've done a couple GDC talks. I, I uh, recommend checking them out. 2017 was our big breakout year where we mentioned, uh, or we didn't mention, we, we announced the new audio renderer that we've been working on, or that at the time it was just me <laughs> working on it. Uh, and uh, basically a multi-platform audio renderer that works the same across platforms. Um, and uh, I showcased some really exciting stuff around synthesis, granulation, spatialization, a bunch of stuff like that. And then announced that we are also going to be porting this to all the all platforms and shipping it on Fortnite. And then I did another GDC talk in 2018, I think, after uh, a couple of years <laughs> later, we had been p sh uh, shipping the audio engine on Fortnite, and it was sort of a retrospective on all the different kinds of issues that we ran into, performance metrics, and all that kind of stuff. So now, uh, with UE5, we're in a position, having done the actual core audio rendering work, which replaced the sort of what we call legacy feature set in Unreal Engine that's like the 25 years that preceded me uh, when I started at Epic six years six years ago, making sure that all that works in the new audio render, then we were positioned to actually work on really cool next-gen kind of vision on what we can do for audio. And we were super excited in UE5 to uh, actually announce and showcase MetaSounds, which is our which is our like big vision of where we wanted to take audio. MetaSounds has been a dream of mine, uh, or something like it. The name MetaSounds we came up with uh, like a year ago. But this idea of a uh, uh, fully programmable audio rendering pipeline so that sound designers have a complete control of making their sounds exactly what they want to be able to do anything that they want to do, including perfect timing. Because uh, as audio people know, t timing is everything. Um, and uh, and so MetaSounds is that is that uh, sort of vision on that. And uh, when we uh, used it on the early access demo and announced it, we were excited to see that there is a lot of uh, community excitement about it. And uh, so today we're just going to talk about MetaSounds mostly. We were also going to talk about Quartz. Uh, if you don't know about Quartz, Quartz is a uh, tech that came out in UE4. Actually, I think it was 426, 425. When did it come out first, uh, Rob? Do you I remember? Guess, uh... Maybe 424. Four, it's been in beta for a while. Yeah. Yep. Something around there. So it's been it's it's a UE4 feature, but it is a big stepping stone towards what we think that uh, game audio needs to have for the future. And so Quartz is going to become a major part of UE5. Uh, the main the lead developer uh, who worked on Quartz was going to be on the call uh, with with y'all today, uh, but he is in a root canal. That's a he's having a root canal. He's not in a root canal. He's having a root canal. Uh, and so he wasn't able to make the call. Um, his name is Max Hayes, and he's on Twitter. So if you have any questions for Quartz, ask him there. <laughs> the, or we, the we forums. <laughs> we'll, the no, forums we'll, we'll, a great place. Yeah, or forums. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> I'm joking. But uh, 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 we, we know all about Quartz, too. So if you have any questions, you can ask us. But we didn't come prepared with a huge Quartz demo, so we're going to focus mostly on MetaSounds today. But if you have any questions, uh, ask them in the Twitch uh, channel, and we'll answer them. I can kind of give you a gist of what it is right now. Cor Basically, what Quartz is is a method from Blueprints to schedule audio clips to happen at uh, uh, sample-accurate moments of time using what's called a Quartz clock. A Quartz clock is a sort of synchronization mechanism that allows the audio renderer to sort of know time, and you can basically say, play this audio clip at this precise moment in time on with musical term terminology so he's like played on this beat played on this bar and it'll perfectly and precisely line that up on the audio render it's a it's a very powerful and simple concept but the cool thing about quartz is that it works for any sound in ue so it's not just a music thing it can be used for all kinds of applications uh right now we're actually working on a feature that uh um max and anna lance which is another audio programmer that was working with us um is a uh, supporting uh, the ability for multiple audio clips to play on an audio component. So you can have one audio component actually handling multiple sounds so that then you can queue up and play multiple uh, quartz events on the same audio component. So you could then use it very easily for something like machine guns or something else that you want precise timing with, but also fine grain control from Blueprint. So it's something we're working on right now. Just talk about it. Um, if you pay attention to the UE5 GitHub, if you have GitHub, check out the UE5 main GitHub. It's where we're checking in our features. It's all open. So if you have any questions about if you see anything that gets checked in, if you're on there, just hit us up. Um, 
But anyway, so let's talk about meta sounds. Uh, meta sounds at the focus. So I'm gonna give a kind of walkthrough. I'm gonna try to uh, do a kind of baking show thing where I'm gonna build something from scratch. Uh, <laughs> but then I have a fully fully made version of it, which I'll probably switch over to some point, but I'll try to start it from scratch to kind of show you this sort of thought process behind making it. Um, I'm using the early access branch. Uh, so you should be able to uh, just download the early access. It's basically, so anything I do, you should be able to follow along pretty easily. I'm not using any of uh, the newer features that we've been doing in UE5 uh, main. Uh, Rob uh, is going to demo some of the exciting tech that he's been working on that expands and extends uh, meta sounds beyond what's in early access. Um, and so uh, there's some, what I would call core pillar features that didn't make it out for early access, but is a big part of the vision for meta sounds. And so he's got a demo that showcases those working. Um, and uh, uh, it's very exciting. So at a high level, uh, let's see if I, I'll, can I share my screen now? Is that Yeah, something? go ahead, Aaron. All right, let's see, make sure I don't have any. All right. So at a high level, meta sounds, it, this is the patch I'm gonna, Give I'm not gonna moment. build this entirely yeah, Good to from go. from scratch here, but this is what I'm gonna start. Just you can see what the, what it kind of looks like as a node graph. At a high level, Meta Sounds is a uh, DSP node graph that is uh, basically uh, rendered in an asynchronous task. So every Meta Sound is actually rendered as a background async task from any other Meta Sound, and also the audio renderer, and also the game thread. So this isn't being executed in line. Um, in the audio renderer or anywhere else. Uh, and as a result, meta sounds actually have some really cool features um, that kind of naturally fall from that. One is that, you know, uh, the meta sound rendering uh, format theoretically could be a different from any other meta sound format. For example, the sample rate, the number of uh, audio frames rendered per render block, um, uh, and the number of channels and things like that can all be independent. So if you look, if you click on this, uh, so this is the meta sound editor, um, just to sort of orient. Uh, I'm gonna assume that people are vaguely familiar with meta sounds, but there's probably a lot of people watching this that haven't seen them. So I might be talking about stuff that's a little bit boring if you've already d d dove into uh, meta sounds. But basically, uh, in this meta sound editor, um, you'll see these tabs up at the top: play, stop, general, meta sound. If you click on meta sound, that's the meta sound settings. And you see right here down in the lower left, mono and stereo. At some point, uh, we're gonna add more options so that you can customize the sample rate uh, and customize the um, uh, um, number of frames rendered, Blocking. possibly even have something that automatically scales those uh, features as a function of some other game metric, like maybe distance to listener or scales to priority or maybe a platform scaler, scaler so that a particular meta sound can render at a lower sample rate on, on a on a different platform. Um, but right now it's just stereo and mono. If you change that, it'll actually change the output format here. If I click this on mono, if I go back to here, you'll see it swap out to mono. I just broke my meta sound, but that's fine. And so I can just reconnect it here. If you uh, are familiar with blueprints and sound cues, which is the sort of legacy feature, this is, by the way, meta sounds is intended to completely replace sound cues. So you should be able to do most of the things that sound cues can do, but better. Sound cues, by the way, are the legacy feature that is kind of like a node audio thing, but meta, uh, uh, sound cues don't operate in any kind of rendering, audio renderer. It's really just a what sound to play and what volume and pitch and maybe a couple other parameters, and that's pretty much all you have with sound cues. So this is actually uh, defining, meta sounds is actually defining the audio behavior at the audio rendering level. So it's really more analogous to uh, shaders. And so we've uh, we've been using that analogy. It's not a perfect analogy by any means, but for people who aren't really familiar with audio, we, if we say it's an audio shader, that kind of communicates more about what Meta Sounds is about versus Sound Cue. Sound Cue, in no stretch of the imagination, is Sound Cue, uh, is a Sound Cue an audio shader? But this is way more of an audio shader than uh, than uh, anything else. Now, where the analogy breaks down is that Meta Sounds are actually rendered on the CPU. It's not a, a hardware accelerated thing. Theoretically, you could possibly put an audio renderer, a uh, meta sound renderer on the GPU, but probably the latency uh, for that would be unacceptable. Generally, audio rendering on the GPU is not 
really a great idea. It can be done, but it's uh, the latency is usually too high, and obviously people want to use the GPU for graphics. Um, and it turns out uh, CPUs are fast enough, especially if you make this stuff async and you kind of handle the CPU load. So anyways, uh, a couple other features about Metasounds. Uh, so it's an, a directed acyclic graph, um, similar to um, other, like probably similar to the uh, uh, material editor. Um, you can't really make uh, loops. Like this cannot be connected here. It's both on the same node. Um, you can't have the output of something. Uh, see, I think you, sh you should... Yeah, you can't do that. Connection would cause a loop. Um, so basically, there's loop detection code, and it prevents you from having anything that would kind of would actually result in a stack overflow. One of the reasons for that is that this is literally the audio DSP flow. It's like think of it as like wh like uh, where uh, it's like a waterfall, and the data is forced to go from one direction to another. There are techniques that you can use to get a kind of loop back, um, but the the sacrifice for that is that it's not. Uh, looping back in the same audio render block, it actually stores the data and will read it back. I'll show you an example. Um, this is a, a piece of music that is actually in the early access branch. You can see here is one of the techniques to do a loop back. So, uh, without getting into do too much details right here, but this on finished sends a, a trigger to this address, which then is read over here and then fed back here. So, this is kind of a way to get a loop back. But the downside is that this is actually writing to it on a on a audio render block and then read from it on the next audio render block, which, by the way, we'll talk about in a second, but this on nearly finished is why that exists. So you can actually write to this before the audio, the wave file finishes, and read it when it does finish. Anyways, so that's getting a little bit into the weeds too quickly, but just to point out that, uh, that there is a loopback uh, kind of support. Um, <clears throat> Uh, anyways, so a couple other features. Uh, all of the nodes, so these are all uh, nodes. We, we intend to allow uh, nodes to have custom viewing. Um, so you can imagine a node that's a slider um, and maybe have uh, knobs and sliders and other kinds of things, uh, ways to like have custom views on nodes. Um, but uh, right now they're all, they all look the same. Um, and uh, it supports different types. So this is a similar, we try to use the same kind of color scheme is blueprint where, where it matched. So green is float. Um, this color is an integer. Uh, sorry, this color is time. Uh, oh, no, no, this is an integer. Uh, Where's time? Uh, this color blue is time. Uh, time is a special type in Metasounds right now. There was a lot of debate on the team. I don't know, Rob, if you uh, can attest to this, but I think you were on the, on the camp of having special types for time and other, other types. We used to have, for example, special type for gain. Um, gain being like the volume of something, but uh, I argued to just make it a float. Um, I, I'm I'm arguing now to just make time a float as well, but right yeah. now it's a special type. Again, without getting into it too much, uh, <laughs> there are some benefits, uh, and and a lot of it is UX related. Um, so at you know when you drill down to the core level, it may not actually make a lot of sense, but at some yeah. point we want to be able to add uh, pickers on there that things can yeah. then choose you know milliseconds versus seconds yeah. and the no designer can determine you know the default or whatever and so yeah uh, there's having a, some there, of that type type information embedded is nice but it doesn't necessarily have to be yeah. a str strongly typed property it could be you know metadata or something so still learning as we go on some of this stuff but basically like the, the idea for having this be a type was like you know the absolute time value uh may be independent of the way that you're thinking about the time value so you know, maybe a parameter takes milliseconds as input, but something else is outputting seconds. Being able to connect those two things with them knowing about what they are without having to do a conversion or accidentally have something in float and then it turns out it's a millisecond thing. That was uh, uh, something that, that they're trying to, and also samples, like, you know, you want yeah, timing to be like number of samples. Exactly. There's a lot of these different domains that the, the actual value in terms of the physics of it is independent but different parameters might think of it in different ways so that's the sort of thinking behind having them be special types and it's good to have uh, the user conscious of the fact that like you know obviously time is not going to be sample accurate yeah. if it's ultimately stored as a float you know when yeah yeah that so. too yep um so there's a lot of stuff like that uh where it's you know metasounds is definitely a work in progress this is early access <laughs> and uh there's a lot of core things that we're still developing uh de debating and developing and, and thinking about stuff and it's kind of exciting to be honest to work on it like what does time mean you know and we're 
trying to approach this with fresh minds. Although there's a lot of stuff that's similar out in the world, there are some things that are unique about Metasounds that I don't think anybody has done, or at least not done the same way. And one of those things is this type, this special type here. Uh, it looks like a blueprint execute pin, but is anything but. We kind of, it it has a, it's, it's a basically a trigger type. It has a, a similar connotation that the execute pin does in the sense that it's like, do something. <laughs> like when this happens, do something. But there's some fundamental differences. One is that the execute, this, this trigger, is actually sample accurate, which means that like when this trigger happens, it's happening on the actual precise sample that that event happened on. So in conjunction with quartz, when you play a meta sound with quartz, this trigger will actually happen to play with on the exact sample that that sound is intended to play, play on. So for example, if quartz said play this meta sound at this bar and that bar sample point happened to be halfway through an audio render block, just real quick backing up, if you're not familiar with audio, Audio is rendered in blocks uh, at a time. So like maybe 1,024 samples at a time. And um, to do otherwise, if you were to render a sample and then render a sample, then render a sample, there, there would be massive overhead and audio would completely collapse. It would be basically like, it would sound like stuttering. It's called under running. And so you always render audio in blocks. And a lot of the problems in software around audio stem from that fact. There's a lot of issues. Um, one of those being is that events are consumed at the block boundary. What that means is when you go to play a sound, it's always going to happen at the top of an audio render block unless you do some special work. Uh, because when the, when it goes to render audio, it consumes all the events that got queued up to happen, like you know set volume, set pitch, or whatever, happens at that top of that block, and then it renders the audio at that point. To, to get an event at any some uh, arbitrary moment in time within that block, there needs to be some kind of scheduling mechanism. And that's what Quartz is. But in the in the world of meta sounds, we take that concept of sample accuracy and bring it within, like within a, everywhere. So every one of these triggers is happening on precise sample points. Um, and so this sample comes in um, and and basically we'll start this thing going. Uh, let's see. Uh, and, and then the rest of these are all happening at precise moments in time. All right. So the, uh, let's see. Yeah, we got bools. We got array support. So here's an array type. It's, it's, we use a similar iconography for blueprints. And let's see. Uh, couple. But I'm basically giving you an overview. So when I start doing something from scratch, it's not gonna blow hey, your mind. Okay. Yeah. Sure. To improve the visual fidelity here, do you have um, play uh, screen share as video checked? I don't know what that. It's an options in the settings, um, which smooths out the frame rate a little bit when you're moving around in the uh, in the editor. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to go to check that. Uh, oh, here we go. Optimize screen share for video clip. Yes. There we go. Is it better now? Yes. Let's see if the um, if the quality holds up. I'm not actually sure. We did this last prep last week. But it looks like bitrate has dropped a little bit. Um, here, you know what? Go ahead and disable that, and just be mindful of when you're moving around the uh, the graph okay, I won't, that I won't uh, frame rate fast. is not as smooth as it is on your end. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to uh, turn off the optimized screen? Yeah, turn me? it off, and then we can actually um, okay. see all of the text a little bit, uh, a little all bit right. better. Thank you. So, um, okay. One more thing is that on the left here are inputs, um, and we have outputs here. In early access, the outputs don't really do much. Um, in UE5, when, with Rob's uh, demos, he'll show you the outputs get a lot more interesting with uh, with uh, the sort of core features that we're talking about. By the way, the core features are composition and uh, presets. presets. And Rob will show that uh, after I do my Martha Stewart here. So anyways, all of these inputs um, are uh, things that you can actually drive uh, while the meta sound's running. So you can actually change all of these parameters. They're analogous to maybe public variables in blueprints, um, where you could, they're basically variables. Um, and you see these like sort of rhythm length here, for example, um, this, uh, uh, parameter here is, you know, integer. And what's cool is that the actual value here is updated while the meta sound plays. Um, I'll show, I'll play this medicine in a second, but while I'm talking here. So, but then the cool thing is that all of these are actually the things that can be driven from blueprint. So every time you see an input here and I like tweak it while the sounds running, this can actually be driven by a blueprint interface. So when you play your uh, meta sound, 
with an audio component, there's an interface that you can set and similar to a material parameter where you might create, define a material parameter for, for, for graphics and you can drive that material parameter from blueprints. Um, you can drive any of these MetaSound parameters or MetaSound inputs from Blueprint. So uh, it's very exciting. So, um, and uh, with this is the sort of first step towards a preset system and that, and Rob will talk more about that. But I think that's enough. Okay, one more thing is that when you click this general tab, um, the cool thing about uh, MetaSounds is that it actually plugs into all of the existing audio feature set and architecture. And so what this general settings tab is is how to like get this meta sound to play um you know what sound class to use whether or not you want to do attenuation settings or how we deal with 3d audio and all kinds of features around you know interacting and attenuating the sound like distance attenuation occlusion distance filtering all that kind of stuff is defined for this so this actually is a huge amount of features here um and then source effects so you can build your meta sound and have it go through the same exact feature set that we have for uh applying DSP effects per source. And then of course, then we have uh, MetaSounds can also use the submix system. So you can do submix sends, um, you can play your MetaSound on a submix and that submix can have uh, a DSP effect. So I have it on demo submix. So you'll see here when I click demo submix, this is the, the submix asset. And then this has uh, DSP effects, all kinds of stuff. You can do envelope followers for visualization, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I have a reverb on this for the demo, so you can so that when I play this, you'll hear some reverb, and that's the reverb setting. So you kind of, you know, dive into it. All right, so I'll I'll demo this meta sound, so you can hear it, and then I'll start with a new one and kind of build some of these stuff from scratch and kind of talk through it. I don't see we've got a little bit of time. Oh, but, you're good, um, Aaron. All right, cool. So here's what this uh, meta sound sounds like. That sounds pretty good. So. So it's totally random. I want to emphasize. I, don't, I, I almost don't even want to stop it sometimes because it can kind of generate cool stuff. And you're like, wait, I want to save that. Uh, so a couple of parameters while this is playing, I'll sh highlight how it can be changed. So first of all, I've got different uh, procedural. These are all, this is all the drums, procedural drums. This is all the logic is for, for drums. And then this is the rhythm generation for the melody. Here's where I get the sort of tempo clock. So if I change BPM, you'll hear it change. Uh, I have the uh, d delay on here, tempo locked. So when I change the BPM, it's actually changing the delay as well. I can increase the feedback on that delay. always fun to demo like doing ridiculous timing so anyways that was we were listening at 10,000 bpm for a second there uh, uh and i have a really high delay feedback here so let's turn that down all right so uh so i've got some panners on here i've got a comb filter system let's see if we can, we can hear it a little flanger mount uh, filtering, this is the sort of filter LFO. It's applying a filter, here's a wave shaper. This kind of, so the actual tones generated are sine tones. I can kind of make it sound. It's like a little bit distorted sine wave. If, you, if I turn this all the way down, you hear it sounds more sine tone. I have a little mixing system here, so you can actually um, mute the. And maybe worth noting yeah. here that all of these inputs that you are adjusting right now could be controlled from in-game yes. events, yes, uh, exactly. parameters. You can yep. hook them up to be, you know, a button press on a gamepad. That's great. Yep. 
So I'm just live demoing them here, just so you can hear. Oh, it looks like there's no snares happening, so the probability of, of the snares is interesting. So uh, and then we get the hi hat. The hi hat sounds really good. So if you go to the snare, go to the snare track, see what the snare probabilities are. So these are probabilities of a snare happening, and it's possible that you know one wouldn't happen. There we go. Now you hear it. So you can actually change the probabilities while it's playing, which is pretty cool. So now we can like sort of make it a little funky. So let's go back down to here. And then uh, what's cool, so just to demo that it's random, I, I stopped it and I restarted, it'll be different. So I made it so that the drums here have a separate re repeat length. And that is defined here, rhythm length. So if I change this to 16, you'll hear the drums will repeat themselves. I can make it. So this basically defines the, the sort of repeat cycle of the drums. And I'll explain this as I build it from scratch, but um, I just wanted to play with, play with it before. I intended to do this after I tried a little bit, but it's kind of cool to just see a full thing kind of working. Um, and the other thing is that the uh, scale chosen by the uh, meta sound is actually also a little, uh, it's an enumerated type that we have built in. So basically there's a, a enum type that any node can register and make up their own enums that they support. And it becomes a custom user generated type, which is a kind of an exciting thing. Um, it's similar to what you might see in, in Blueprint. I want to emphasize none of this stuff is Blueprint code. This is not Blueprint, uh, something I didn't uh, highlight. Metasounds compiled directly to C++. So this is all native right off the bat. There is no scripting intermediate layer. It, layer. Uh, it actually is straight up, straight to native code, native C++. Um, so in, in that way, it is more in the direction of an audio shader. So anyways, um, so this uh, node here basically converts the enum type to an array of floats uh, that d define like a scale, um, basically like a musical scale um, using sort of MIDI conventions, um, or you could think of it as a semitone scale. So half steps above the root. And so it's like between zero and 12 is what this array is gonna be. So it'll be like an array, an ordered array of like zero would be C, you know, two would be D, etc. Um, and so that goes into here, and then we have this node that's just sort of randomly picked from an element in this array, and then it'll output that value. So that's how the nodes are getting chosen here. So if I were to pick out a different scale, so you can see, uh, let's pick, uh, let's see, chromatic, Phrygian, let's, uh, let's do um, whole tone. That's always exciting. <laughs> A little bit more more out there so let's try lydian lydian is probably one of my favorite modes so lydian is kind of similar to a major it sounds major except it has what's called a, a sharp four it's the fourth mode of a seat of the uh sort of diatonic scale we're not going to talk about music theory here but it's in order here it's the fourth mode and that raised fourth is kind of like hyper major. It, once you get used to it, uh, it's kind of a little bit spooky, but Lydian is awesome. Anyway, so there's that. And then uh, let's see, uh, here's the melody length. We can control that independently of the drums. Here it repeated. All right, that's it. Um, so I'll uh, I'll start this from scratch. You can kind of see uh, what it looks like uh, to think about this from from first principles. All right, so over here, let's um, uh, let's see where's my live stream here. So this, by the way, is in the um, I'm just doing this in a dev folder here on in uh, the actual uh, early access project. So this is what they they show you on the early access project. So if I, if I were to push play, you would see the uh, the uh, 
what's it called? The ancient Valley Valley, Valley of, of the Ancients was the official sample. name. Internally, it was called Topaz. So in your brain, <laughs> yes, brain which was everyone's well aware because <laughs> it was real difficult for us to stop saying that. In one Extract. Of yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, so basically, all you got to do is right click sounds and make meta sound. Uh, we have the uh, we've stuffed sound cues in legacy, and as through UE5 as it goes along, we'll probably put more stuff under the legacy thing. We're still supporting sound cues for a while. Uh, Fortnite uses sound cues, thousands and thousands of them, so we can't get rid of them entirely. But um, we meta sounds is intended to replace sound cues, and so we will be over time moving things over. Um, there's probably going to be some work gone into trying to automatically upgrade sound cues to meta sounds, but it's not one to one, so there'll probably be a manual step at some point that we'll have to figure out. But anyways, in, in the meantime, just click meta sound. Um, Rob will show uh, a thing in his demo in UE5 main where you, there's actually uh, two types now. There's meta sound source and, and meta sound. So this this is what's called a meta sound source. Yeah, effectively, it, it, the the type will change names when yeah. I show my demo, but it's it's effectively the exact same thing. Uh, so when you double click this, a meta sound source uh, defines what's uh, what's called an archetype. Rob will talk about it in more detail, but um, this is a source archetype. So that means you'll get automatically an input for when the sound begins, and there'll be automatically an output for you to indicate that the sound is done. So my last sound here, synth melody, if you'll notice the output note is just sitting out here by itself lonely. This guy is not intended to ever stop, so I just don't worry about it here. But uh, lots of sounds will have, if you want, basically the idea of a one shot, you'll want it to tell the audio engine when it's done. Otherwise it's treated kind of like a looping sound. Um, so, like in terms, it's not technically looping. It's basically an uh, an endless sound. Uh, endless sound, yeah, never ending. <laughs> yeah, never ending sound. Uh, and so uh, there'll be some work done to kind of warn people in certain contexts if you're using a meta sound that doesn't have an unfinished uh, that it will be orphaned. You might just have these things sitting out there. So similar kind of issues in game audio where you have to worry about looping versus one shot sound. And if you just have a like a looping sound out in the universe, just like looping a machine gun, <laughs> it might get stuck. It's, we call those stuck loops. Um, so you got to tell the audio engine when it's finished. Now, fundamentally, meta sounds is procedural. So there is no way for the audio renderer to know that it's done or not. And, you know, you can't just do like, oh, is it silent? Because who knows? Maybe the meta sound is going to have a lot of silence in it. And that's the intention of the sound design. And, and we have, this is kind of a good point to mention too. We have talked a little bit about potentially giving designers the options to to stop things when it's you know but but we would have yeah, yeah. to have an intermediate space for that but that is absolutely a feature set that is completely yeah yeah like all, just auto stop when you're done there's things yeah. that we can do along those lines maximum um, duration etc so yeah so anyway so on play and then here's the audio output so if anything you want to hear goes to here and it defaults to mono so i'm going to make it stereo right off the bat um so now we have stereo so to show, I'm going to just do, uh, let's do a sawtooth thing. Um, so this illustrates something really important. If I were to click this to here, let's do it on both. Uh, actually, it might be really loud. So let me do an audio. Uh, so uh, multiply, multiply audio by float. That's what I want. Audio by float. So what this is going to do is take the audio signal. And I want to emphasize this is an this is DSP connection here. This is an audio buffer connected to this node, and it's going to multiply all of the audio here by this float value per sample, and then connect the output here. So here, when I click this, oh, here, let's do it like that. Let's make it a little bit quieter. Blow your ears out. So. Notice that it started generating audio and I didn't even connect to the on play. Some nodes uh, will just do their thing regardless. Now, this enabled here allows you to kind of go like this. You could say uh, uh, value, is it maybe? Yeah, value bool. This is one way to do it. So you can maybe go like this. So now it connects it. If I were to do this, it'll turn it off. So this is a way for you to like sort of dynamically set values. Um, I'm of the mind that I kind of want to do another pass on our oscillators before 5.0. I don't kind I don't really like the fact that this just generates audio without a trigger. So I might argue to actually make this have a trigger start. But anyways, the point is, is that the trigger, unlike blueprints, the trigger is not required to do something. It's just, if you need it, you can use it. Um, 
So, which is kind of an interesting paradigm shift, uh, and it probably is confusing. Um, so, and then if I change the frequency value, now right now we don't. Use it, this is called a literal input. We don't have support for changing the literal literal input while the graph is running and having it update. So I can't do that here at update right now in early access. There is a uh, a feature request to allow literals to update, but if you want an update, you got to promote it to input. So I just basically what I did there is I picked it off and I said promote to input. Um, similar to blueprints, um, but I just I'm going to use get saw frequency. And by the way, the inputs can you can get the inputs that you have anywhere in the graph wherever you want, so you can use it in multiple places. So it was smart enough to kind of name the input based off of the parameter. Uh, so I'm just going to call this here like pitch like that, or maybe frequency is probably better, just like that. And then now it can be updated live. So I'm going to demo something really cool here. So let's do it with the sign. This is a little bit easier to hear with sign. So this is just the sign tone. You hear, by the way, a little zippering, where it kind of hitches a bit if you go fast enough. That's because the nodes aren't themselves doing any kind of interpolation internally if the frequency changes. That's sort of what this glide is for. If you were to change this glide, it's a little bit smoother. The higher this value is, I think it goes from 0 to 1. It smooths out that thing. And I think uh, lots of glide, this will change really slowly. So that's what this parameter is, is to do sort of interpolation if you need it. Um, you don't always want it, which is why it's an option. So phase offset basically makes the oscillator sort of offset where it decides to start from. This is really important if you've got multiple oscillators playing together and mixing together, or if you're using one oscillator as a like kind of modulator or low frequency uh, oscillator. So for example, I can actually do this map range, let's say, so this is a map range node that basically maps the range, and it's an audio rate mapper, which is really important here. So the the range of the input is negative one to one because it's a, by default, that's what oscillators output. That's what you hear in audio, but I'm gonna map it to 100 to 500. So if I were to connect this right now to the output, uh, it would blow up your speakers. So this is one thing about, like some people are like, oh, I wanna be able to hear, I wanna mute, nodes and I want to hear what that audio signal is. You really can't do that because you don't really know what the signal is going to actually be, whether or not it's going to be good for your speakers. So what we do want to add is an oscilloscope. Uh, we want to actually add an option where you can say right click, show oscilloscope and actually see the audio thing, but you don't necessarily want to hear it. Uh, this is different than sound cues where sound cues had a feature where you could like sort of preview the audio in each of the nodes. Um, materials have a similar thing where you're like, oh, I want to see what the material graph is from just this node. You kind of don't want to hear audio because it could blow up your speakers, but you want to see it. So oscilloscopes, spectrograms, that kind of a thing, that's what you want, and we want to add that. Uh, so anyways, this is an audio rate. This is an audio buffer going between 100 and 500 at, at a pretty high rate here. I'm going to make it slow so you can hear it. So this is going to be 1 hertz going between 100 and 500, and I'm going to connect it to the modulation input here. And so what this is going to do is basically add, it's going to mix these two together. So it's this bass frequency with this LFO modulating it. So you can hear the power there. Now check this out. I'm going to promote this. I haven't, yet. I'm kind of improvising here. I haven't even gone to the procedural music stuff yet, but this is still pretty relevant and interesting. That's great. So, Thanks, Aaron. Uh, this is a, let's, let's call this a mod frequency. So check this out. So now I can do the mod frequency and now I can drive it. So it's at one Hertz now. So because this is audio rate, I can go into audio rate frequencies. This is what's called frequency modulation. And so what I can also do is drive this 
so frequency modulator it's fm synthesis basically it's an fm synthesis this is an fm synthesizer <laughs> defined by the 80s <laughs> the 80s is all about fm synthesis uh so i can actually drive this with itself an lfo or even modulate that so you could <laughs> just do this you can modulate the modulator and this is this is the the origin of fm synthesis let's just... And so, you know, FM synthesis is hard to work with, but basically this is what you can do. You can create an insane graph of modulators, modulating modulators. Uh, and that's the, that's what FM synthesis is all about. So anyway, so that's what this modulation here is. There are some people in the community going like, what the hell is that? So if you uh, want to modulate a parameter, you could have an audio buffer as a, as a parameter. And the audio buffer can be thought of as an audio rate modulator of that parameter there's something i didn't talk about uh so uh which i'll it's just relevant here so uh the trigger i mentioned is sample accurate this frequency value is not sample accurate this is actually consumed at the block boundary um and so this value won't be you know this is just like hey set the value and then when the audio goes to render it gets the last value that was set at the beginning of that render block and then feeds it to the system um but you can get around that by using an actual audio buffer, which is, you could think of it as a parameter per sample. <laughs> uh, and so that's what that's, that's about. That's how we sort of have an audio rate. We call it the audio rate, which means per sample uh, parameter. Doing sample accurate floats is something actually that we're thinking about doing, basically using the same mechanism that we have for sample accurate triggers to actually bundle data along with it. So we can actually get uh, sample accurate floats, but but there will always be what we call control rate or block rate uh, parameters because it's a hell of a lot cheaper to have uh, block rate parameters. You don't want to have everything be sample accurate because that would be insane. It would also be hard to program too. Um, it would get make really really complicated code. Um, sample accurate triggers are a little bit more complicated to handle. I'm not going to go into detail on that how that looks, but if you are a programmer, just load up. You know, a good one may, maybe to look is the uh, AD envelope, which I'll show you right now. So AD envelope is an audio rate uh, attack decay envelope. And so this is actually, well, let's start making my uh, procedural melody. Uh, all this does is essentially, if you say audio multiply, this, uh, the word envelope is basically just a signal that is, uh, can be used for anything. It can drive any kind of parameter. Like this envelope, actually, I could feed the output of this, put it through a mapping function. And this, the envelope is between zero and one. Uh, and then it would be kind of like a, you would go like, like, you know, it's basically just a signal generator. Um, so, but we typically use them, whoops, uh, for creating sort of amplitude envelopes, like contours would be like, wow, or boom, you know, kind of a thing. And so I'll do that. So here's where we need the trigger. So if I just do this and then output back to here, uh, it won't make any sound. Why is that? Because the trigger is just outputting zeros until it's triggered. So now uh, I want to use the on play. You can hear it kind of start and then it kind of fades out. By the way, uh, oh yeah, that's not working for triggers. So I can make the decay here, decay time like really long, so let's say 10 seconds. And when I hit it, it takes 10 seconds. <laughs> so I can actually control the, the curve of that. Let's, let's uh, get rid of the modulator and make it 10 seconds is kind of long for the demo. Let's do three. There you go. So you can see a nice exponential decay. So this decay curve, if you look at the, the tooltip, exponential curve for attack and the uh, exponential curve for decay. So if you're less than 1.0, it does like a B. Logarithmic would be like D, like kind of a thing. Exponential is like D, kind of a thing. So, uh, and then you can illustrate the attack here. Let's do a two second attack or one second attack. You can hear it kind of rise and then fall. All right, so 
let's do a trigger repeat. So here's where you get the sort of beginnings of the procedural music. So trigger repeat, basically when it gets triggered, it just starts then outputting a kind of metronome. So this is a sample accurate, precise metronome. So let's make a, the attack really short and the decay shorter than, let's do that. So you can hear, this might be now too quiet. Let's put it at 0.7. So now you hear this sort of, what's cool is that then I can drive this period. Let's, uh, this is in seconds. So let's use a utility node BPM to seconds. So BPM is just a little bit easier to think about. Uh, so let's promote this to graph input. Let's do this BPM. Bomb is not what I wanted. Ship it. <laughs> All right, so now, so is that, you know, let's do it like, I, you know, if you're a music person out there, 120 is, uh, John Phillips, who's a All right. Someone's going to clip that and fucking loop it. Whoops. Anyways, right here, F uh, BPM. You can hear arbitrarily fast. We can actually drive that by LFO, because uh, it's fun. Why not? Um, let's do uh, LFO. Let's make it 0 0.2 hertz, and then make it go from, say, 50 BPM to, say, 1,000. I don't know. 1,000 BPM. And then go like that, and now it should work. You can kind of hear the smooth. So to me, this illustrates the power of sample accurate triggering, because uh, if you didn't do sample accurate triggering, you would hear uh, when, once it approached sort, what, the block boundary, you'd hear what's called event quantization error. And so you'd start hearing it kind of like snap to the minimum rate at which the audio is getting rendered at. So um, if you know uh, audio, there's this idea of the Nyquist and aliasing and all that kind of stuff. So aliasing happens. <laughs> In many different domains, uh, event quantization error uh, can actually result in event aliasing in a weird way, where the events aren't lining up in a, in, a, in a proper fashion. And so this is pretty much the closest that you can get. One of the reasons why you want to use like sort of analog or hardware for synthesis is because of this problem. Because in, in the world of analog and hardware, events are just, they just happen when they happen. And the, the resolution is basically the resolution of reality, or at least a lot better than digital audio. And so this is uh, basically getting us in software back to the, that kind of feeling of analog. And when you um, when you play with Metasounds, if you're paying attention to that, it actually, you feel that under the hood, that lack of quantization uh, error. Now keep in mind, the parameter here is still gonna be, like, so this BPM value in the seconds, this is changing at block boundary. But importantly, this is happening at arbitrary samples in time. So as this is getting a new period, this is going to smoothly constantly trigger within a block, which means that, th and this is all audio rate. So this is all going to happen at, at, the, at the level of samples, which is why it has that like kind of perfect, perfectly precise kind of sound. All right. So now, uh, so we got this ridiculous thing going. Um, let's get it back to regular BPM. Let's connect it to here. So the next step is to sort of like pick some notes. So we got this going on. Let's make it a, by the way, this BPM is, uh, I can make it eighth notes, uh, quarter notes, 16th notes, 32 notes, or some crazy fraction thereof, like, you know, 4.5ths notes if you want, which is, why would you want to do that? You can create some really interesting stuff with like multiple triggers. I'll just show you real quick because I think it's easy to do. Let's just do this real fast. Copy, paste. And let's add these two together, add audio. So now we're going to mix signals. This is literally what an audio mixer is, just adding stuff together. Um, by the way, uh, this is another thing to, to bring up. Um, this looks like it might be expensive to have sort of audio branched off like this. This is an audio buffer. 
It's actually by reference. There's no copies that happen when you connect an audio buffer to an audio buffer. The This is literally referencing this, the data that's in this node. It's not copying it whatsoever. This is actually reading directly from the data here. So when I do this, this is just one copy of the audio buffer, and it's just reading it by reference here and here. So this is actually not like duplicated audio buffers. Um, so anyways, uh, so I have multiple... Let's get this guy over here, trigger this guy, let's start him. And I can make these off by a bit. Even just a little bit can kind of create interesting patterns. Let's call this um, frequency two, so you can sort of quickly do that. So you can make it more, whoops. Doesn't let you have the same. All right, here we go, so. Things that are just slightly off can kind of create interesting patterns. Sort of like uh, when you're at a stoplight and you see all the different people, you know, with their left their turn signal on, and you can kind of see them kind of lining up, and they're kind of close, but not. And they can kind of create interesting patterns. So, anyways, it's called phasing in music terms, and it's kind of a fun thing. So you can create like cascading musical patterns that way. All right, I'm going to, let me just go back to here. Let's put this back here and this right here. All right, uh, let's now do the beginnings of a random melody generator. So random, let's do random frequency. So let's say between 100 hertz and let's say 1,000. That's the first step for a melody generator. So instead of just driving the parameter there, we're going to do that. And I'm going to grab this trigger. So the same trigger can be used in multiple places. So let's do that. Now we've got sort of a random like computer beatbop sound. And then of course So even if this frequency value is consumed on the block boundary, you don't really notice it because the envelope is still being triggered at audio rate. So at some point you'll start hearing sort of to like a double trigger. You can kind of start hearing it. In other words, like the frequency value hasn't been updated by the time it does another envelope. Um, but anyways, uh, like I said, you, we could do a random, I think we have random audio. Oh, I don't, I didn't make a random audio, but you could do like an audio rate random, but, oh, noise. Yeah, noise is it. So noise is a, basically, you can think of that as a random audio thing, which case maybe that should work. In fact, you could just do that. Oh, that, so the, the, oh, I know what I need to do. This is between negative one and one. Let's you do a mapping range. That's what we need to do. So let's do map this between, uh, let's do it between 100 and thousand this is actually really interesting audio rate random and then what we can do is set the carrier frequency to zero so it's basically going to go zero plus whatever is generated by the noise uh, and then it should be audio rate random interesting oh i see what the, what the issue is is that this is <laughs> it's changing <laughs> the the frequent the value while the sign is playing which is actually kind of interesting that actually sounds really interesting. So rather than triggering it at the rate of trigger of this, uh, so we can actually do sample and hold, which is what we want. That's what we want. Uh, da, 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 da. This is what we want. So now we'll get, so what sample and hold does is at audio rate, it's gonna trigger the, uh, it's gonna basically sample the noise value here. In fact, I could probably make this a little cheaper sample this guy then do the mapping here let's so we don't constantly do audio rate mapping for every damn sample and throw every sample and then throw it out i'm trying not to swear all right so 100 and let's do a thousand so i'm improvising here by the way this is not what i planned but it's fun this is what meta sounds is all about is exploring by the way there we go that is audio rate it, it, you can hear that it does sound different Sounds a lot smoother. 
So this is the power of audio rate randomization. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I actually haven't tried this before. That's pretty cool. All right. So anyways, sample and hold is a really valuable tool in your toolkit for audio rate stuff. All right. So let's not do audio rate randomization now. Let's just do regular old random float. This is going to be, let's do a similar kind of 100 to 1,000. Let's just try that. Get back to this. There we go. So now this isn't really music yet, right? Because this is just randomly generating hertz values. So instead, what we could do is have a utility called MIDI to frequency. And so what this allows us to do is to convert a MIDI value to a frequency value, which is really important because frequency is nonlinear. Um, and now I can do a random float and then think in terms of music. So here I can say uh, in, the, in the world of MIDI, let's say 40, uh, let's see, what is it? 36 is low C and, or yeah, it's 36, I think. And then uh, 72 or 60, let's do 60, which is also C. So this is a couple octaves. Let's do 72. So now it's like sort of more musical. Let's make the, let's uh, put this up, promote that to graph input so we can get a little bit longer decay time. There we go. So now it's just random notes. Still not great. But at least it's sort of more musical than, you know, it sounds like it might be just randomly playing notes on a keyboard. So now let's uh, go one step further and say, uh, what is this, uh, scale to note array. So what this can do is take an enumeration on what scale you pick. That's the thing that we, we over here in, on our mega graph over here, uh, that's what this guy was. I said Lydian. So going back to him, so let's do this random get. So we this is a an innovation I think. Uh, I've shown this to was it Chance or somebody? Uh, uh, I can't remember who, but we were showing this to somebody. And they're like, why doesn't Blueprints have that? It's a really useful tool to just be like, here's the array input. Give me something random from that, rather than going like, what's the length of it between zero and this, and pick because because I could just do this, and we do have uh, get just like a regular old get get the value of the index. But it's just a lot of nodes, um, and this is just really useful. And we do randomly random selection from arrays constantly, so this is a very useful utility. So now what I want to do is do that, but then I need to add. You'll see here in a, see in a second why. But I'm going to add then like an octave range. Let's add 36 to that, and then do this. So instead of randomly generating a pure note, what we're going to do is on trigger repeat randomly generate from uh, randomly pick from an array here, and let's just keep it ma major scale. Let's do, uh, let's make this 48. So now it's just basically playing notes off the like white keys of a keyboard. Um, so uh, the next thing is to get a really good melody, we want to have repetition. Right now it's just going to randomly pick from a major scale any random note. So let's get some repetition. Uh, and that what we use for that is trigger counter. So instead of just taking the value directly from this sort of metronome clock, we're going to count it. Uh, now I've got, actually, I'll, I'll show you my one of our print uh, integer. Uh, where is the log? Uh, the log is over here. This is annoying. This is one of the things I've requested to our editor team. I would like to have duplicate logs, and I would like the log filters to stay persistent. Uh, between usages, Let's see log, yes, yeah, so log meta sound. Okay, so basically, I want to lay out when I make a new meta sound thing. I like to see this log in here like this. This is my own custom layout. All right, so when a trigger happens, I'm actually going to log the value here so you can see. This is you can see it counting, and it's just going to count it forever, unless I do reset count, which is going to be let's do eight. Now it'll count up to eight. So then when it resets itself, we get this reset trigger, and I'm going to connect that to this. So what that's doing is saying, hey, random node, uh, 
the seed that you use to pick the elements from the array, reset yourself, your little internal pseudo random number generator, back to the, what you were at the beginning. The seed negative one means to when the node loads to just pick a random seed. But I could choose a seed so so I could like kind of search for seeds. So you should hear now it's a melody. So what's interesting psychoacoustically, I would call it psychoacoustics, is that looking at the count here, it doesn't seem to reset where I feel like it should reset in terms of listening to it. Like I listen to it and I'm like, the melody sounds like it's restarting here. But that's what you're doing is you're imposing on, on the randomly generated stuff your own interpretation of the melody, which is based off of your like experience through life and listening to things. And you're sort of hearing a kind of resolution. You're basically inter you're subconsciously interpreting it and you're hearing a phrase, like a musical phrase that's not really there. Um, and it doesn't line up with the, rep the rep repetition, which is kind of a fascinating and subtle thing. You could probably write a psychological study on that. So every time you do it, so it's 100 here, let's put it back to negative one so you can sort of get it randomly each time. So that one actually lines up on the one. To me, it sounds like it's resolving on the, on the seven to eight. Anyways, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing, but that's a poor, cheap way to get a random melody is to just repeat it. So it's like, one thing is, in music, uh, intention is communicated by repetition. So if you're, I, I'm, a, I'm a big, I don't even know this, uh, if you know who I am, I'm a big jazz musician. And sometimes you make a mistake when you're improvising and then just do it again. And then people go like, oh, wow, they were just being like really clever. <laughs> just repeat it. <laughs> so it's an insider pro tip on improvisation. Uh, so anyways, repetition is the key to music. So uh, however, randomly picking from a major scale, even if repeated, is not guaranteed to actually sound major. Um, and so that's what this chord tones here is for. So if I click chord tones, you'll see it's just picking out like C, E, G. I think it's just C, E, G. Uh, maybe B. It might be hitting B. So if this is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, it's getting the thirds and I think the major seventh. Yeah, it's getting the major seventh. <clears throat> so uh, that will help you to make it sound major. Uh, what I do uh, is a trick here, and you'll see over back here, uh, that's what's going on right here, is I actually have this sort of modulus on the count, uh, and then I basically pull out where I am, I kind of subdivide if it's a strong or a weak beat, and I pull out the chord tone versus the non-chord tone, and I'll show you how that works. So this counter comes in here. I'm going to do modulus, modulo. Uh, let's do every let's do every two. So basically, this is we'll do a, a log here, uh, so you can see what it looks like. It's going to be zero one zero one. So what you want to do here now is say trigger compare is a node that we have. And what we want to do is when this is equal to zero, then it outputs true. If it's not equal to zero, output false. So we want true to mean pick a chord tone. Um, and we want false to mean pick any, any tone you want. So let me give myself some room here. Let's do that. All right. And then so true is to pick a chord tone and then I'm going to copy this and false is going to pick any note so if I'm on the zero we're going to define that as like a strong beat so we want a chord tone if I'm false I want it to be up to a pat what's called a passing tone or whatever you want to do and here's where we get to an interesting thing with meta sounds so if I were to do this it will replace it so how do I get I want I don't only want one generator. I don't want multiple generators. That's wasteful. So I just want to basically when this trigger happens, pick from this one. If it, the other one picks from this one, and then continue on the graph. Uh, I don't I obviously don't want to mix them together like that. So how do I do that? So because Meta Sounds uh, and the reason why you, unlike Blueprint, Blueprint you could do this. Meta Sounds is a is a DSP flow graph, which means that this connection, as I already said, is a benefit but also kind of a limitation. 
this thing can only have a, a read reference from something else. So this is actually either read referencing from here or read referencing from here. There's no data copy. So I can't have two read references. So what we did was we made a node at trigger uh, route, I think is what it's called, float two. So what this does is basically allows you to have one output pin. It's kind of combines output pins. And what it does, give myself, this is a problem with node graphs in general, is that you kind of like get slowed down thinking about layout. So when this guy's chosen, I want you to route this value to the output. When this one's chosen, I want you to route this to the output. And I could choose to forward on and if I needed to get this event. So we have, we're trying to get this idea of triggers kind of have a forward pin because you end up, you'll, you'll find in cases where like you have to like have a bunch of crazy triggers branching off of one trigger, but I'm going to ignore that one. So essentially this will now allow us to uh, pick a non a passing tone and a chord tone based on our arbitrary decision on the phase here. I'm, I'm going to ask yeah. that one random question too. Sure. What happens yeah. if they both hit at the same same sample? You mean this right here? Yep. Uh, then it'll pick, it, it's up to the node itself to define yep. uh, what the order is. And so uh, this is actually a really good question about um, order of operations in Metasounds. 99% of the time, it doesn't matter. It resolves itself. You don't, you don't have to think about order of operations um, because it is a flow graph. It's not like, there isn't a sort of do this, then this, then this, then this. It just is constant. Everything's doing everything all the time. So you could think of it literally as like data flowing. But if these do happen on the exact sample, which is possible, uh, because, you know, maybe, you know, you have a trigger repeat. You know, that's very, you could do something like this, and then this could go like this. Or even the on play trigger, for instance. Yeah, you could do Somehow that. Somehow flows through both of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this will trigger both of them, and then so what'll happen there is that it's up to the node. Unfortunately, there's not like a standard that is in the graph itself, but we want it to be. There's sort of a suggested standard that makes sense. So presumably, you would probably write this where set one would basically stomp the value of what's been happening on step set zero. But it's not. There's not a sort of graph enforced order for. Uh, trigger execution order. Essentially, the node would actually logically happen. Both They would both happen at the same time, logically. And so you'd have to say, which one do I do first? Or what's the, what, how do I resolve that? All right, uh, so here we get this. So actually, I'm going to use this on set to generate a random, uh, let's say, random integer. And what I'm going to use here, let's this is going to choose the octave. So let's say gener generate between 0, 1, and 4. And then what I'm going to do here is convert this to float. Uh, and then I'm going to map range. Actually, it's easier to just do multiply. And then this is going to be multiplied by 12 because there's 12 notes in a, in a traditional thing. And so let's actually, this is going to be which octave range on the keyboard. So let's do like three and five. And then now we get this. So now you notice that it, it doesn't feel as repeated re repeated now. It's because I'm not resetting the random integer here. So I can actually just forward this on reset here to there. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'm not resetting this guy. So I was like, why is it different? So you basically need to, <laughs> when you want true repetition, you want to make sure that all the things that are randomized are reset. There we go. There you go. So now we've got something that feels more major. Now what I want to do here is promote this to graph input so that I can then ha make sure that the same scale degree is chosen. Or same scales. Real, real quick before you move yeah. on to just a, a small nomenclature thing that we've kind of adopted. Uh, you'll notice like on some of these nodes like random get where you have an input that's reset and then an output that's yeah. on reset. Yeah. That's the, that is actually passing through the exact same, yes. same trigger uh, yes. data object. So um, it may feel like it's it's got some sort of flow Copy. to it. Um, yeah, but it's it's actually, that's just an additional reference. It's more of a readability thing. Yeah. Um, so.
Yeah, it's a readability thing and like convenience thing because like I, I like to otherwise I'd have to go like this. Yep. You know, it's just like uh and uh, by the way, on that note, we do want to add reroute nodes and things like that. Uh, with Rob's thing where he's talking about composition, a lot of this kind of craziness will be a little bit cleaned up as well. Um, anyways, so this graph is not the Blueprint graph, although it uses Ed graph, which is the C++ thing under the hood that's also used by Blueprint. That uh, basically allows us to get stuff like this for free, alignment. Like this, this is just part of every Ed graph now, which is great. Um, so we get that for free because it uses Ed graph. Um, and it, like, you know, all you got to do is say, connect this pin to pin, and it uses the same code as blueprints. So there is stuff that we inherit from blueprints, but there's other stuff that's very different. So stuff like reroute nodes. I don't yeah. know if that's part of EdGraph. Do you know if it is, Rob? Yeah, I mean, kind of. So yeah, the whole editor layer, basically, and uh, we have another uh, senior audio programmer that, that kind of works on the more of the core layer of, of Metasounds, but... The, the, without going into too much depth, they basically um, uh, we're using kind of the, the Unreal Engine's editor side, but it's pretty much divorced and, and uh, yeah. the underlying core Metasound code um, is fully portable in that in that yes. manner. But but yeah, we absolutely use a lot of the same, um, like pretty much, I would say 70% of the editor code, um, underlying editor code is is, is obviously similar to, to Blueprint. Um, yep. But it's all editor layer, so. So uh, yeah, that I didn't. That's something I also didn't bring out is that Meta Sounds, the Meta Sound renderer, and the Meta Sound code is is. There's a lot of like effort that we've done to try to keep it as decoupled from U objects. So there's no U objects involved in this except on the editor layer for for literals. Like uh, I haven't talked about Wave Player, but this right here, this Wave asset, is a U object, and so you can get all of the sounds in the project and play it. Yeah. Um. That's what I use, by the way. The wave player is what I use for the for playing the drums. These are wave players. Yeah, and we use and, uh, like U object serialization, obviously, yeah. but um, under the hood, it actually com can convert that to JSON, and we is it. Yes. Sounds has its own kind of yes. complete format as well. Yes. So. When you copy and paste this stuff, it's actually copying pasting into a JSON format. <laughs> actually, uh, so, it's still it's actually using Ed Ed. Of, oh, is it? Oh, I thought yeah. it was JSON. Oh, yeah, because it? there's certain nodes that actually don't make it down to the editor oh, or the I sound see. layer. Okay. We may change that in the future, but um, like comment nodes and things like that. Gets ah, yeah, 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 good point. Anyways. Uh, there's a desire to be able to share through JSON your node layout. We probably want to make the layout even. Yeah, we're we're moving like, toward that. But yeah, yeah. Still, like cust custom, uh, even for comments, you could say like, although the comment makes no sense, if you were to like build a you know for a VST plugin or even Unity, like we have this sort of dream to have MetaSounds itself be a, a thing that's even could be independently licensed yeah. outside of UE or something, and so. Comment may not make as much sense. Who knows? Well, there's there's lots of yeah. potential. And each of the like, for instance, the input nodes that are on the Ed graph, those are actually um, uh, represented in the on on the MetaSound front end side as as a single node um, with just some locational information. Yeah. Um, so we have a little bit of work to do there, but that yeah, that's ultimately that's that's where we started, and then we started implementing it in UE. We had to make some shortcuts, and now we're gonna you know eventually go yeah. back and kind of clean that up so we can keep keep that decoupled nature uh, as as much as possible. MetaSounds is definitely a multi-year project. This is not going away, uh, and you'll see a lot of changes. Hopefully by 5.0, we can get a lot of our ambitious stuff out, but it'll probably, I'd say like five years from now, we'll look back Cer at this live stream and chuckle at how primitive it was. Yeah, certainly all the pillars we want now so we don't yes. code into a corner. I mean, yes, that's, that's exactly. our main goal. Exactly. So I'm going to do a real quick thing. This is a synthesis technique. Uh, I'm going to do dual sawtooth. So my other one that I demoed is sine waves. I'm going to do a sawtooth version now. Um, and basically what I'm going to do is add these two guys together. And this will be our generator. If you recall, this guy is over the envelope. Let's bring it over here so it's a little more visible. Um, we also want to work on variables, by the way. Uh, variables so that like something like this doesn't have to stretch across the graph. Um, but anyways, um, uh, what I'm going to do is actually uh, do what's called detune. So I'm going to actually take this MIDI note, and I'm going to uh, basically add a value here. Let's say plus add. I, I really want to, we also want to do this so that keywords like you can in Blueprint, when I say plus, it'll 
we don't have that yet, so you have to say add. <laughs> Just little little details. We're aware of them too. So if you're out there doing the meta sounds, we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. We know. <laughs> uh, all right. So there's that. Uh, and then this is going to be like a detune amount. So basically what I'm doing is taking the note that's been generated to play. I'm adding a little bit of uh, like sort of semitone offset, then converting that to MIDI or to, to float for frequency and then adding it together. Now, this is going to create a really cool kind of sound. So it's a very classic synth element. So what I'm going to do is promote this to input. And this is going to be called detune. And you'll hear detune uh, has a really cool sound. You can go positive or negative. If I do it 12, it'll be an octave. And then you're already recovering some of the classic. This is like so much of the synth, like badass, or sorry, awesome sounds that you know are actually just sawtooths. <laughs> Castlevania <laughs> like audio exactly. comes full circle in the world's most like complicated. Yeah. <laughs> not really, it's not complicated, but but uh, but anyways, this trick right here of dual oscillators mixing together is like such a the source of awesome sounds. So now what we want to do is filtering to complete the trifecta of what's called subtractive synthesis. We got to have a filter. And so uh, if you type on filter here, we've got a lot of filters we've implemented. State variable is a very beloved and well-known filter in the world of synthesis. And ladder filter is a type. Um, and then we've, of course, got our, our simple filters. We put sample and hold as a filter. There is debate on if you should call sample and hold a filter. Mathematically speaking, it is a filter. But I don't know if it, when someone thinks about filter, I don't know if they think of sample and hold. But anyways, uh, that's there for now. There's a lot of philosophical debate when we're working together on this. All right, so I'm going to use the ladder filter because it's my favorite. I'm a big fan of Moog. So uh, if I put it, let's do it like 500. You'll hear that it's awesome. And then LFO is a classic way to modulate that. So let's modulate that by an LFO. So 0 0.5. Uh, let's make this go from 100 to 700. 100 might be too much. Let's try that. I know, let's make it go to 1200. Open it up. Maybe. There we go. Make it a little bit more resonant. There we go. And 0 0.5 is a little bit too fast. This, these are all can be parameterized, of course. Very analogy. Now let's get some panning action going on. So let's see. Let's make this. So we have a couple panners. We have stereo panner and ITD panner. Uh, I should re remind Pete that uh, this actually could be spatialized in the engine using our normal spatialization. So if you wanted to attach this little melody generator to an actor in a level and have that actor move around, it could even get HRTF spatialized. This could be put into a level. It could be occluded. Could be you basically use all of the stuff like I said that anything else is going on. So this could be like a little, you know, 3D object in space. But because we're in the editor and for demo purposes, I'm just going to do the panning here. Let's make this do it be an LFO. So the ITD panner is called it's inter aural time delay. It's basically 90% of an HRTF. It doesn't do the uh, filtering based on angle. An HRTF head related transfer function does panning uh, via volume differences, which is called inter aural level difference, um, or uh, ILD. Um, and then it, does, it, it will encode also the sort of time delay. Basically, your ears are separated in space. And so since sound takes time to travel, uh, you know, it'll hit one ear before the other. And so that's what this is doing. And then there's the final step of a HRTF, which is actually filtering based off of the angle. And that's off of like your head shape. You know, it causes kind of spectral shadowing. The, the your pinna and the shape of your ear will actually filter the sound based off of the angle, and that gives you the full binaural like sort of panning technique. 
Um, ITD is very, very cheap, though. It's a very cheap panner, so it's like gives you 90% of an HRTF without the full expense of also applying a filter. So this, the angle is 0 to 360, so let's just make this 0 to 360. So it just kind of randomly alternates around, the, around your head, and here we go. It's a little bit fast. Let's do it 0 point. 0.5, so what's 0 0.05? You hear it kind of panning around. And it's a very nice panner. ITD is a very good panner. Um, this is actually now too quiet that we put, in my opinion, the filter on it. All right, at this point, let's show uh, how to hook up a reverb. So I'm going to do this meta sound. We don't have reverb right now in graph. But we do have, uh, actually, it's the general here. Um, like I said, uh, demo submix here. So, oh, I have two. Uh oh. Let's see what that sounds like. There we go. You hear the little bit of reverb on there? Yep. So, I'm going to find it. Is that the correct one? Let's look. That's using demo reverb. Let's load up demo reverb. All right, so I can I can change the reverb in real time. And it should be noted too, like, um, you know, obviously one of the benefits of routing everything through submixes is the virtue of, you know, only having a single effect chain that's, you know, acting upon multiple sources. Um, it's fully in our intent to, to bring the power of metasounds to effects as well, so we can, you know, potentially design, you know, metasound effects where you have just a, a standard input output of audio um, and design your own effects and then share yeah. those amongst uh, sources. Um, not in a compositional way, which would obviously compound the, the expense of, of whatever that, that graph is functioning and doing. Um. Well, I just looked at the time. I'm having a blast, but it's 12.30. Let me, so I think this is probably illustrative. We caught, we talked through the, the logic on here. The next steps that I was going to show are how to do procedural rhythms. I'll just do it real quick because I think it's not that hard. So let's let's just finish this with the procedural rhythm. Then I'll go back to the this guy and show how I did the drums off of what I'm about to show you. Um, let me actually de decouple this to make sure I got the logic on that. Uh, all right. So let's see here. All right. All right. So going back to my new MetaSound source. So when this trigger comes in, what I want to do now, I want to make a separate trigger counter. It's useful to have, uh, for reseeding purposes, independent things reseeding sub parts of, a, of your procedural music graph. So like I could have the rhythm being independently reseeded from the melody generation and even different drums might have different reseeding cycles. You could even like have a randomly generated seeds and then cycle through those. So you could be like, okay, read this seed, now read this seed, now read this seed. And that's how you can sort of procedurally generate musical structure. Um, and it's a very deep topic. When I, back in the day, I wanted to go into computer music and composition. Uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, what, I don't know what just happened. There we go. Um, I wanted to um, actually write a PhD on this topic of like seed structure for musical generation. All right, so we're gonna count here. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is create a new input. I'll just show you making a new input from scratch. This is gonna be, uh, let's call it melody rhythm, uh, RH rhythm prop. All right, so this is gonna be, I'm gonna turn it into an array. It's not gonna be bools, it's gonna be floats. And I'm going to add, let's say, eight elements. Yeah, let's do eight elements. And uh, I'm going to actually put in numbers here, which represent the probability that a note might happen at that uh, at that moment in time. Uh, so this uses a kind of uh, structure here, which when I was doing the procedural music on Spore, by the way, I wrote a lot of the procedural music on Spore. There's uh, Kent Jolly and I kind of discovered this. Uh, I think there was a paper we read on this where there's a kind of like probabilistic rhythm archetype that kind of has this structure where it's like higher probability, lower, kind of medium, lower. It's like a fractal of probability to generate mel uh, rhythms that uh, sound like a human would have made them. 
Um, all right, so basically what I'm going to do now is get that probability table, get melody rhythm prob. And then what I'm going to do is say get. I'm going to say get, and then as this counts, I'm going to actually retrieve the element at that index. So I'm going to actually use the uh, length here, or was it num? Uh, so this is the L the length of the array, and I'm going to do I'm going to modulo on this based on the length of the array, so I don't accidentally read off the array. So now I can like change the size of this array and not worry about this counter matching it up properly. Um, and then this is going to go here, and then I'm basically uh, have associated a sort of beat cycle phase with reading an element from that array. And then on trigger, what I'm going to do is say random float between 0 and 100. So right here, I've, just remember that this, the, I put these between 0 and 100, where it's like the probability. And then uh, I'm going to generate a random number. Then what I'm going to do is say trigger compare. I'm going to use that compare that we already used before. Uh, I use that over here for to compare integers. But now I'm going to compare floats. And so what I'm going to do is compare the element that I generated here. And if that is less than or equal to the element that I'm reading from here, then I'm going to say I'm going to generate a note. Uh, and that is what I'm going to use for that guy. So this is actually really interesting because I'm going to keep this count being fed into here. So as this triggers, it's going to be writing into here this value, but I'm only going to really look at it when I decide to play a note. And this is important because I'm keeping this strong and weak beat cycle consistent. So it's going to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then when I read the melody here, it'll be like, OK, given where you are on this phase, generate a note, and it'll, it'll consistently keep this sort of strong wheat beat beat definition and pull off the major and minor scales. So, uh, and then uh, for resetting, uh, let's make this, so this is gonna become like, so your length of your rhythm, I'm gonna just keep it at eight for now. We can pr pr parameterize these so that they, you know, can be independent. And so I'm gonna reset this choice at periodically, essentially. So let's see what that sounds like. Uh, something is wrong. Clearly, if I disconnected this, your your git's missing a trigger. Oh, that's what it is. Where is that? Uh, ah, yep, on trigger, right, right here. here. Yep. Oh, I know what the problem is. This AD is triggering off of this, not off of this. Off of this. This is a little bit unfortunate, but I'm gonna have to do this. So let's actually get this guy to, a little bit faster. That doesn't seem right. Uh, so here's where debugging might help. Let's make sure that we uh, print off. Let's make sure that we're getting this to be random each time. Yeah, that's right. Let's make sure we're reading this. Oh, it seems to be working now. Why is it? I feel like this is getting reset too much. Let's try that. Yeah, so this reset for some reason was re-triggering too much. That trigger counter doesn't have a reset in. So that was kind of interesting. This? Yeah. That's fine. Oh, well, but you were pulling off on reset. Oh, I see. Well, this this on reset happens when the reset count happens. It kind of auto triggers it. Ah, uh, OK. Notice cool. it does this. So it should be working. But anyway, this is illustrative, by the way. So I'm not resetting the rhythm choices. But what's cool is that it generates a rhythm that still has a feeling of a pulse, which is what I, which is what I was trying to get at. With this sort of probability table, so listen to it. You'll you could like kind of snap your fingers to it. So you, 
keeps that kind of pulse. But uh, the issue is this reset. Uh, let me try. I think maybe the issue is the reset is probably too short. So let's try that. Yeah, and this is a just too severe of a PF. It's actually kind of fun, by the way, doing procedural music, because you're like, once you get something working, it's different every time you start it. <laughs> there we go. So you hear the... it's basically repeating. And so that's how you get randomized beats and randomized melody and a thing that kind of makes sense. And you can apply this sort of trick, this sort of mel melody probability trick, for all kinds of stuff. You could have a baseline generator that's doing something different from a melody or a chord. This could be something that's generating chords, and you can have a whole separate probability structure for chords, and so you can imply and enforce chord progressions and things like that, same same kind of techniques. And then for drums, uh, what I did, let me go back, since we're kind of short on, or it's kind of taking a long time here, let me go back to uh, this, where's my, oh, I have it over here. Um, so this, uh, now that we've kind of talked through it, you can kind of see I've, I've spent some time cleaning this up, but this looks should look familiar now. Um, I've I parameterized low octave, high octave, so you can kind of change the octaves on this. I, I parameterized the strong beat phase, which kind of influences your melody generation. Um, so I have the rhythm length for the for all of all three of these. Uh, oh, the rhythm length for the melody is parameterized independently of the. Uh, Oh no, I actually drove everything, both the, the rhythm of the melody and the rhythm of the drums off of the same length here. So you can see this on reset triggers all of these. So you kind of on reset triggered up here. Um, whoops. And uh, so you can see the, the similar technique. Now for drums, it's basically the same. So this is the same kind of pattern. That, this is basically what I did for the melody. So you can see this true comes down here, generates this. Same basic structure for each of these and these, these are all different. The primary difference is that when I go to generate a note over here, it was like to go to this melody generator up here. It's like, just pick a random element from this bucket of samples I have. So I said like, I'm gonna play a drum. Now I'm going to actually generate. And so I've just basically made an array of drums. These are just vinyl sounds, vinyl drum hit sounds, and then hi hats, uh, and then snares and you can, or kicks, I should say. And so from that, uh, the, the thing that makes it feel like a groove is that they all have different probability tables that, you know, say so I click between the two here, you can see kick drum has probabilities that are sort of more aligned to the downbeats or, you know, uh, whatever. And then snare drum has a little bit more higher probability tables on where you might expect an uh, upbeat. And this itself could be randomized and changed. Uh, you know, you could imagine an array of arrays and randomly pick from different tables. And then, of course, hi-hat. Uh, here's an interesting illustration of the hi-hat. I just have it as two, an array of elements of two with equal probability that's generally pretty high. But um, I could make, say, for example, this go, so it'll be like, it'll make it sound more ride-oriented, like kind of a sound, versus this would make it sound more more busy, like kind of a sound. I could add four elements here, and it'll cycle. So I could say, uh, you know, here and then maybe like this, then like 5% chance to do that. And then that might be like, you know, kind of a sound a little bit lower. And so if we play it, you can hear the effect on that. Change the BPM is really low. Oh no, what was it? It's this guy. So you can hear how it might change. Very cool. You can hear the, how the things make a change. Just pretty cool. So part of what makes this groove work is I'm just randomly picking from the hi-hats here.
but I'm repeatedly picking, because this is getting reset, which variations I pick, which is a big key thing for Groove. And of course, these arrays can be manipulated. Uh, let's let's try this. Uh, one more thing. Let's just try it. I, I, could, I could probably play Metasounds for hours and hours and hours. It's pre pretty fun already. So let's do a set uh, like that. And so when I hit a trigger, what I could do is let's make it index 1, because that's kind of funky. Uh, and then let's, I'll just leave it. Ah, I ran into a bug. I'm going to do this. I ran into a bug where I'm deleting things. Where's sketch? Whoops. Whoops. Uh, where is it? Here it is. All right, should be good. All right, so what I'm going to do is when this triggers, I'm going to generate a random value here. Or LFO. Let's LFO it. So we're going to LFO the probability of the second element, which is kind of crazy. So let's do 0 to 100. And then let's make this kind of slow. So you can, see, you'll hear it kind of like LFO variant, variant. And then this I think has to be here, and then this has to be here. So this should kind of make it funky. Which is pretty freaking cool. So uh, yeah, you could do a lot of stuff. Um, all right, real quick, because uh, I can hear people out there going, this is ridiculous. This would never be used in a game. First of all, it would. Uh, this is uh, Spore. I worked on Spore. And what I, I would have totally shipped something like that on Spore. Um, but here's a more practical example. If you haven't checked out the uh, Ancient Valley demo, uh, all of the sounds are done with meta sounds, and there's lots of practical examples. This one I wanted to highlight is a orchestral music piece that's sort of randomly mixing and matching different pre-composed elements uses this sort of reloop trigger to con do sample sample accurate concatenation so for example when this thing almost finishes playing it loops back around here and then picks a new element uh, i guess here there's only two things to choose but it'll randomly pick queue up the next wave to play and, it'll, and when this wave player is designed to sample accurately concatenate when it finishes it's currently playing sound if there's a new sound in this node, it'll start playing that on the exact sample that the previous one finished on. So this is a sample accurate concatenation technique. Um, you can this, see that. Yeah, go ahead. The, just real quick, the the transaction system may seem complicated. The receive and send yeah. stuff. We we have plans to kind of bake that into a local system, which will just be like variables effectively wrapping yep. that. So yep. you'll see another space up here next to yep. inputs and outputs, which yep. are private variables, and that'll yes. give you your your yep. your ability to do all this with a little less hand holding. So this is what that sounds like. Just here, it's basically always kind of randomly varying and always shifting, never exactly the same. It's sort of like a procedural looping, crossfading music, ambient music system. Um, it also uh, was used for a lot of other kind of cool applications. This is a sort of procedural campfire sound. So it'd be analogous to a uh, Niagara particle effect, where he's kind of spawning little clicks and pops that are filtered randomly and phasing and sort of basically not a loop uh it's noise it there is a loop in here i think uh oh no no it's no loops there's no loops on this it's just sort of random sparks yeah i don't see any loops oh no this is a loop right here campfire loop <laughs> i'm looking right at it so there's like a, an element base but this has no sparks and so all the sparks are kind of procedural and random and it kind of it, it makes a huge difference um in a game and there's tons and tons of other yeah, and uh, just to repeat here, uh, all of this that Aaron is showing right now is available in the Valley of the Ancient sample that you can download from the yes. Epic Games launcher. So the um, the the music you heard right there, as well as the campfire sound, uh, together with the uh, fire VFX, uh, you can find that in the Valley of the Ancient sample that you can download yes. from the Epic Games launcher. So uh, if I, I just this is the project right here, you can see all the meta sounds that they used for the project. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of like bread and butter sounds. Like here's one that might. More. You know, kind of a thing. 
So, anyways, uh, with that, I will hand it off to Rob. Because I think I, I went way longer than I expected, oh, but no. I was having a lot of fun. It's all good. <laughs> I actually, got, that's a great, great segue, too. Um, uh, yeah, so I was going to point to a couple things there where we could kind of, as a, as a place to pick up here. I'm sharing my screen, by the way. <laughs> You're looking good. good? Cool. Um, i do a quick uh, audio test here. You hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna easy bake oven this a little bit too, just because uh, for the sake of time. Um, and you'll notice things look a little bit different here. We're experimenting a little bit with some some UX things and and whatnot, but um, all the basics are the same as 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 what Aaron mentioned. This is on on our main branch here, so uh, none of this is currently available in EA, but you know, we'll be soon. We'll be polishing some things and adding some. I don't know if we're pushing this stuff to EA, but you you can get it uh, once we check Correct. it in. Yeah, sorry, like five main. Not yeah. yeah, not for EA, but in a in a subsequent. We're trying to build. keep EA stable. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sorry if that was not clear. Yeah. We're not pushing it to EA, but you know, this will be coming in a subsequent release. So, um, I as he was talking there, I, I was going to show kind of my logic here, but I, for in the interest of time, I'll just make this real quick. Um, as he mentioned earlier, we now have uh, two different asset types. We have just a generic meta sound, which can be thought of as a, effectively a function with no uh, particular archetype that it subscribes to. It's not, it doesn't have to play sound, but it can. It doesn't have to, you know, input triggers, but it can. Um, and the idea is that these are basically shareable assets that can be referenced in other meta sounds. And then, uh, what an EA is is seen as a meta sound is actually a meta sound source. So you know, as you can see here, we've we've updated that um, to to be reflected in the in the graph and the the asset editor accordingly. Um, and this is exactly the same as what what you saw on 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 his side. So um, you have the same archetype on finished on play and your output audio. You can swap between you know your source. Uh, excuse me, your uh, your your output format yeah. and whatnot. But um, but effectively, all, all that this all boils down to is being able to share functionality. Um, it all still gets copied down to the same graph. Um, per, you know, performance-wise, it's it's effectively the same as, as as implementing any of this logic within your um, within your parent meta sound itself. And this is kind of the the notion of composition. So I've got um, a meta sound source and this just real basic repeater uh, meta sound. Uh, vanilla meta sound graph. Um, we have four inputs, BPM division, uh, a trigger to start, and a wave to play. Here and, we're and using... to, to be clear with this, there is no default inputs and outputs. He made yep. all of those inputs yep. himself. And, and we can delete them or add them as much as we want, you know. Um, and then and you could just... have like trigger outputs, you could have float outputs, anything. Yeah, yeah. and there's and there's nothing stopping this from being a particular um, it, from being a meta sound source really, because if I I'm implementing the you know most of the the archetype here, but that's just by. But uh, meta sound sources are the only thing that have U sound base. As exactly. Thing. So that can actually be played directly. Yeah. Like you can't play a meta sound in blueprints or anything. Yep. Only meta sound sources. Yep. And this this will allow us to, in the future to be able to expand, um, you know, evaluating graphs and other scenarios. So again, I mentioned effects earlier in in our you know submix system or our source effects or yep. whatnot. Um, that's absolutely our intention and to be able to kind of port this, this functionality over so we can use it virtually everywhere. Um, the, the, in EA, we were really focused on, you know, getting as close to parity as possible with what you can do with sound cues. And, um, this is kind of our next advance in, uh, pushing meta sounds forward so that we can, uh, share topology between graphs, um, we could potentially have performance wins again by like copying certain graphs and moving them to effects chains that are then shared between sources all of that um this is kind of moving in that in that direction and and uh allowing us to avoid again coding in the, ourselves into a corner so by having separate assets but sharing the underlying you know meta sound core uh, in these scenarios and then having different archetypes for different scenarios whether it's an effect a source or just a, a utility function um, it, it, it buys us all that. And then in addition, uh, we had we, we have a whole versioning system or set of versioning systems under the hood, uh, which will allow us to nativize a lot of this, right? So if you create a really expensive meta sound uh, graph, whether it's utility um, or, you know, ult ultimately a utility, I think is what meta sound is what we probably consider versioning or you'd have, you know, your, your gameplay programmer or whoever version, um, you would absolutely... Uh, be able to do that and then, you know, kind of swap that that graph under the hood um, for something that's that's nativized. 
Um, but yeah, to, to give the basic rundown here, I created this repeater asset. All it's doing is taking in this information very similar to some, some of the design that uh, Aaron showed just without the, the randomization or, or you know, flare. Yeah, and, and pretty fun. much the, <laughs> all you need to do is just add a probability table and a counter maybe. Or yep. <laughs> um, so we create this repeater. Boop. And then when we go over to the source, we can right click and we can find our new function here. Um, it has all the same inputs and outputs as our, as our graph here. We can hook it up. So on play, we want to start this thing and then it just starts generating audio. It's going to generate a, you know, our kick sound, um, every 120 BPM. One question I have is what defines the, uh, uh, what defines the order of the nodes on that? Sorry, this is oh, all sure. work in progress too. I should say yeah, we haven't. It's, he it's actually totally literally hasn't checked this in. He's been working on yep. uh, know, it, the edge cases yet. <laughs> so um, as it stands right now, I believe it's the same as the inputs okay, and I outputs see. on here. But um, I see. Yep. yeah, there's some display ordering things that we want to add yeah, to yeah. that. There might be a little bugs here, you might, here, there that you might see. So yeah, yeah we want to have input in ordering progress. support and categories and stuff like that at some point. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just going to create a mono mixer. This is all in mono just for the sake of the demo. I'd, kept it simple. Um, and then what you can do is you can create multiple repeaters. So you'll notice in the ancient Valley demo that there's a lot of, you know, people make these comments and then just like wrap a ton of nodes and then yeah. copy and paste that everywhere. Um, that those days are numbered. I mean, we, we yeah. really want to be able to share functionality and this is where we go yeah, with that. So like you, you write a bad, uh, an awesome node once, and then can reuse it for there thereafter forevermore. Exactly. In fact, so we'll then, we'll probably uh, create a plugin that is like MetaSound Node Utilities, and so it's possible that we'll just be making cool nodes. Yep. And Absolutely. then just use ours. <laughs> so um, it's but also, it, it it's an opportunity for uh, Unreal Marketplace kind of stuff. You know, like if you have some cool ideas, you you can write your own C plus plus nodes really easily. By the way, so if you're a programmer, it's really easy to make new MetaSound nodes in C plus yep. plus. If you're not a programmer, you can make really cool utility nodes and share those. Um, so, so you'll notice that, yeah, that repeat. Go ahead, Victor. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to ask if. Uh, so, is it safe to say that the equivalence of a material function would be just another MetaSound source? Uh, I believe so. I mean, it's it 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 shares kind of a similar like func mm, you know function. No, system. material we, function uh, would be a MetaSound. Right. MetaSound correct, source sorry. would be the material yep. itself. Yep. 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 Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yep. We have so, those questions coming in earlier uh, sure. where folks were asking sort of uh, the similarity. That's why I used that. Yeah, yeah. There's, it's, Absolutely. It, it, but it's different. It's not really a function. So I wouldn't think of the MetaSound composition as functions as much as encapsulated node behavior. Yeah. It's not, it's not, there aren't really functions per se. They're nodes that do stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But in in the use case, they are treated uh, very I mean, similar. Can, they're, yeah. they're, it's analogous, but it's, I wouldn't. I would get away with thinking of them as, as functions. That's, that's a good call out. Yeah, yeah. Because but functions you, are like, you you execute it once. This is a flow graph, so it's it's right. just always flowing. It's mm -hmm. yeah. It's got some similarities to functions. Others kind of as a macro, if you will. But yeah, yeah given our our DAG design, like um, yeah, they're kind of a, their own class of thing. Um, so yeah, so I I basically duped over this repeat. We got our, you know, four on the floor clap there. We can add whatever we'd like to here, you know, basically to, to reuse this repeater and, and anything we change within the repeater, then, you know, if we, um, let's see if I wanted to, uh, promote the, the beat multiplier, I could then do that. Uh, so we'll call it molts or something, you know, as soon as you come back over here, you're going to see molt then shows up as well. Yeah. Um, all of this happens, uh, you know, basically, as soon as the, the assets loaded, or in the case of the editor, we reload um, uh, the re you know we rebuild the reference on the fly. And what's cool about that is you don't have to necessarily repatch all of all of your assets. So if your yep. function signature changes, uh, the serialization code actually tries to to fix it up, you know, as best as possible. Um, obviously, there's caveats to that, but in the case of adding um, adding pins or, or changing defaults and things like that. You get that on the fly, so you don't have to repatch a bunch of assets, which is yeah. extremely important for, like, yes. obviously for live games like like uh, Fortnite. So, like, like, to make that really explicit, you could have a utility node that's used in a thousand instances. That is, although maybe you have, with presets he's going to show you, there would only be really one preset. There might be mm -hmm. a thousand, like, instances of that preset. Uh 
or I should say, a lot of pr thousands of presets that are on the same MetaSound source. Uh, and then if you were to update a sub node, you don't have to like repatch your whole game. It'll just yep. propagate correctly without recooking. It'll just work. Uh, yep. So really simple, stupid beat, you know, just to kind of give the idea that, you know, that repeat functionalities were used. We've, we've, you know, parameterized some of this behavior and then, um, you know, away you go. Now, as uh, Aaron mentioned, we have presets as well. So this is a, a super powerful thing. It basically layers on top of that idea of composition, um, the ability to have, you know, preset input values um, and then change that underlying uh, functionality without having to, um, and, and be able to modify the API in a kind of an intelligent manner without having to, to rehook everything. So this would be analogous to a material instance. Yeah. Uh, we decided to call it different than material instance because there's one powerful thing that MetaSound presets have that material instances don't. I'll let Rob talk about it, but there, we debated it. We, at one point, we're going to call it MetaSound uh, instance. But yeah. You can, you can talk about that. So uh, again, you can kind of hot swap on the fly, the underlying uh, behavior and, and the serialization code as things, you know, or as these presets are loaded, we'll, we'll adapt and use the default functionality from the, from the referenced uh, graph. Um, but here we have same beat. Um, we can set our snare, you know, we can change our uh, clap or our, uh, did I, ah, the wave, the kick. So for instance, I missed the kick. I can prom promote the kick and add it here. And then if I go back to the preset, it's just added automatically. And then we can go here and change it to a different kick. It's got a little bit quicker to decay um, and you know change our BPM whatever we want and we can basically layer uh, our our functionality on top of this while you know sharing our, our input sets and then we can so, create a bunch of these and bang them out real quick importantly um, the UX is still not uh, where we uh, want to see it uh, yeah, absolutely but uh this is the biggest big step towards that well we so um, in UE, when you do an, uh, if you, you know, uh, edit a property on, say, a sound wave or a sound cue, um, you don't have to go into the whole graph. Uh, if you, uh, when you say, like, for example, select a whole bunch of different assets, and you can right click and say mass edit, and you can just see them all on a list. We we want to work on a thing where you could do quick mass edit previewing of setting preset, preset input yep. parameters, so you don't have yep. to like double click and then go to the thing and say just like from outside of it see all of your MetaSound presets and what their values yep. are and quickly adjust them and even apply mass editing to them. Yeah, so there's two basic uh, like paradigms that we want to add to to presets. This is very much the scaffolding. Um, this this took care of kind of the the, the lower level issues of versioning and serialization mm -hmm. and being able to to update, you know, your API on the fly yep. and, and, and the system to do the intelligent thing, quote unquote, without having yep. to patch a bunch of data. All that is kind of what we've been working on as a as yep. our as our phase one phase two is to add you know widget capabilities to yep. this so having again you know aaron might be going to town and making this huge awesome uh complex graph but you really want to be just you know tweaking like five inputs <laughs> yeah tweaking like you know yeah five ten inputs or whatever you know and all of that that underlying you know randomization and filtering and all that can just be hidden under the hood um and then you know he could build something effectively in umg to yep. to to drive these these parameters, so that's where presets really are huge. Um, they, they to, to, under, to underscore that though, the idea is when you double click a preset, it would be cool to rather than show this graph. This graph is yeah. literally what it is. This is literally yeah. a, a sub component. But instead of showing this, we could show a skeuomorphic interface from UMG. Right. Skeuomorphic being like it looks like a synthesizer. <laughs> yeah. Instead of showing you like nodes, it'll show you sliders, widgets, knobs, and really yep. cool interface that you can build your preset in an intuitive way. Right. And save it, you know, and then do so, mass editing as well. So. I mean, when you're designing a graph that can kind of be thought of uh, in many ways is, is using it in kind of the hardware synthesizer land, like creating, you know, plugging in your patches to yep. your, your bay or whatever. And then, you know, each of these individual connections is your, is your is your connections you know within your your bay and but we we are basically taking a step further where you can then design out of those you create yeah. 
that bay, you can ship that, right? You can make it look like something, redesign it. And that's really the power, obviously, of software is there's, there's, there's no limitations there. So we've started uh, a uh, plugin library for audio widgets. Do you, you want to show them the audio widget library? Basically oh the meter that you see in MetaSounds. I wrote yeah. that quickly before EA. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's a, I wrote that very quickly. Uh, but uh, it's basically the first step towards a audio yeah. custom UI widget thing. That is a reusable widget that you could use for yeah. all kinds of things. Um, and it and, and it is part of the audio widget plugin. So yeah. we're gonna basically put in all kinds of audio widgets, like two D sliders, knobs, you know, um, spectrograms, yeah. oscilloscopes, all that kind of stuff. And so we you have, just easily, quickly. We have uh, a professional um, uh, UX designer who's yeah. been working, Rachel Burbaum, who's been showing us awesome mocks, yeah. and then we, you know, we build those into UMG, uh, make them more performant, then yeah. to translate them into C plus plus code, and, and that'll yeah. be shared, you know, across things. We we did it more for effects as a test, uh, but we want to bring that over to MetaSounds, yeah. obviously. So that's... basically, he's saying for source effects, we did a prototype to yeah. when you go to edit a source effect preset, which if you're familiar with UE uh, tech, you know, when you go to make a like a flanger effect or whatever, we have all kinds of effects that we support. Um, yeah. Basically, if you go to the effects, uh, we have a ton that we've made, and those yeah. are all plug-in extensible. So if you're a programmer, you can very, very easily make your own effects. I've written some tutorials on how to do your own. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we experimented with showing a UMG editor widget instead of the effect, and it totally works. So we know that it'll work. It's just a matter of time of adding yeah. skew morphic uh, interface support. We're, yeah. And we've talked with the editor team. We're like, hey, we want to do this. Is this crazy? They're like, no one else has done that, but I don't see why you couldn't do it. And it's like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe it'll be a thing in UE. But I personally know that sound designers uh, out in the universe, I know this, if you have the exact same code running, <laughs> one of them shows you a bunch of parameters uh, and another one has a beautiful like wooden interface with like awesome, beautiful sliders, they will say that the one with the interface will sound better. <laughs> than the one that's not that even though it's the exact same code there's a kind yeah. of like subconscious it's like the excitement that happens yeah. when you have a skew morphic interface i totally it's the get reverse it. of like you know <laughs> things looking higher fidelity when the, exactly. there's sound versus that's exactly not, right. right oh that yeah. so we for sound design we, we always talk about how audio makes things look better but but it goes the other way things that look better make things sound better it's actually yeah. a really good point i never thought about that Shit. Yeah. I mean, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Number three there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've said. It. Anyways, I'm trying hard. I, I'm a pirate. Uh, but but to <laughs> summarize, effectively, presets are uh, the the ability for for designers yeah. and developers to create their own you know rich interfaces, UMG interfaces that can then basically uh, be layered on top of this yeah. this versioning and serialization. Yes. And then uh, mixing the power composition as well, which is yeah. also a tool you can use in vanilla MetaSounds and MetaSound sources. And then finally, as, as Aaron mentioned, our last piece for that would be mass edit and having yes. like a mass editor for presets specifically. So. And the ultimate final piece, this is to kind of give you an idea of where we're trying to take MetaSounds, uh, uh, is to use MetaSounds in the context of effects, like submix effects, source yeah. effects, and that kind of a thing. So rather than, so we have all this previous architecture, source effects and stomachs effects and stuff. Why not have a, instead of a meta sound source, it's a meta sound effect. effect. And yep. it can be slotted into your effect chain. So sound designers can just make their own DSP effects as well at that point. And there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to support that. So yep. our vision on meta sounds is broad. Uh, in fact, you may even think about a meta sound submix. You could even do like build a, you know, submix graph where you have some kind of, you know, format mixing, channel mixing. Right now, MetaSounds only supports mono and stereo, but uh, that there's it's just a function of time where we'll have arbitrary uh, form, uh, channel format support, at which point you could imagine all kinds of interesting... I mean, you could even just do your custom spatialization in a MetaSound, you know? You don't even need to use our uh, engine spatializer. Oh, and one more, one final thing to, to mention on this is we have the uh, input uh, support from Blueprint. So we haven't shown that, but it's it's just basically an audio component uh just play it and then there's an interface that you can set on it we're massaging that to make it a little bit easier especially as we roll this out on yeah. fortnite but it looks similar to setting a material instance parameter basically it's like you have to type in the name of the the input like clap and then the value that you want to set it on it's unfortunately there's no way to like uh get a reflection off of this back up to blueprint in terms of types we looked into it there's a reason why material instance parameters have that and it's unfortunately the same thing uh but uh 
uh, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, we want to also have uh, sort of different layers of parameter spaces. This is I'm basically talking about the idea of parameter modulation, Rob. So mm -hmm. Rob has wrote the parameter modulation plugin, which is in beta, and uh, we haven't talked about it at all yet on the, the thing, but parameter modulation is a big UE5 idea as well, where we want to generalize the idea of controlling audio parameters uh, in, ga in game audio. So you have this idea of a parameter bus. It's similar if you are if you have wise experience, it's similar, but simpler and in many ways more powerful to an RTPC. But basically it's a, a parameter bus and have the parameter bus be something you can access uh, from Metasounds, but also write into. Um, and also have some parameters available just by default into Metasound. So for example, if you play a Metasound on an actor, being able to automatically derive where that actor's position is in space, automatically derive where the listener is and do and get that data in metasounds automatically and have a way to kind of preview it in the metasound editor so you could say like what happens if my sound source moves over here what does it sound like and that kind of a thing um there might in, in include like sort of specialized uh, editor widgets to kind of help you simulate sort of uh, game state but um but basically, the idea is that we want Metasounds to have access to rich data that you can use to drive your sounds. Right now, all that just goes through inputs. Um, but uh, it's it's a it's it's on our list to yeah. you know just have it available, like get listener position in a Metasound graph. You know, and effectively just make a more rich experience around uh, parameterization that is shared between yes. modulation and, and yes. Metasounds. You know, more generally. Yep. Um, and and the other the other big idea. So quartz we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, Quartz is really powerful, and it automatically out of the box works with Metasounds for the onset, for the on trigger. But the next step is to actually get a deep integration of Quartz into Metasounds, where you actually have the Quartz clock uh, directly in the Metasounds, so you could get events from the Quartz clock directly and do you know event triggering sample accurately from a Quartz clock. So you could say, use this clock, and instead of having like sort of the trigger repeat methodology for getting timing events, you could actually just use a quartz clock. And then that allows you to have multiple meta sounds, multiple audio events, everything perfectly synchronized to each other. So you could have meta, like, you know, 50 meta sounds in a level, all of them using the same quartz clock, doing interesting, perfectly timed stuff off of each other. Uh, and asynchronously generated and all that kind of stuff. So quartz clock integration, um, uh, parameter modulation, audio modulation integration, and, and uh, just more rich experience for meta sounds in general is where we're taking this stuff. It's years of work. So by 5.0, our, our goal is to get some of the UX issues that exist with Metasounds ironed out so it's a, a little bit easier to use on 5.0 launch, especially because we are we're, we're got to use this on Fortnite. Um, but there's going to be years of work on this to make it really, really, really awesome. All right, so I guess it's really late. We're excited to see it. Here, yes, but... but you know what? I'm not going to let you go because we have a lot of really good questions. <laughs> um, and I definitely want to make sure we do cover some of those. Yeah. Um, but thank you both for your presentations. Um, good presentations usually lead to a lot of good questions, and that's what we got here. So I'm going to try my best to um, go through these as quick as we can. However, Aaron, I will say yep. um, let's go with the short answer sure. for most of these <laughs> um, <laughs> instead of the long one. And if you would like yeah. to uh, we can follow up, iterate, yeah. we can follow yeah. up on the form announcement post, which is where we announce all the live sure. streams on the channel. Yeah. Um, we'll and that's the best place for post yeah. live stream discussion. And sure. I, for the questions that we weren't able to answer today uh, due to time, I will send them to Aaron and Rob. Yep. Um, and then they can go ahead and iterate if they want to on them in the form announcement post. So uh, first off, I've been waiting to ask this question. This is my question because I've seen <laughs> you do this throughout the entire stream and I didn't get a chance to ask it. What's the key bind for play stop in the meta sound uh spacebar spacebar for now fantastic it's the, same, it's the same one to start and stop so it's a toggle that's great <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll probably uh, make that uh, uh customizable as yeah, well yeah yeah we, we want to do customized they're typing binding. in you know things into the text box or whatever so if people want to do control space or whatever we'll probably yes yeah. we just need that that's a real simple simple fix yeah sweet thank you and potentially you can hook it up to uh another device uh what's that called the um midi well, open sound control. Um, it's there's this modular device that we're we're working on to use for all kinds of uh, editor module, editor input where you can customize. Never mind, we're probably gonna do. Yeah, yeah, no, no. There's there's a, a, a enterprise working on this sort of generic layer for mm -hmm. device interaction. Um, they actually implemented open sound control in MIDI support. We we found out we internally the there's like a status side. update. Yeah. And we're like, wait, what? Uh, so it's a one of the teams in Montreal for 
live production stuff. And they're they're actually getting it so you can do keybind mapping to like arbitrary inputs and like your MIDI keyboard or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, you ought you ought to consult with us because I was on our list of things to add support for. But they're already kind of doing it. I spent um, I spent an afternoon kind of experimenting with getting MIDI into Meta Sounds. It wasn't too bad. The the main issue though, obviously, is is um, uh, like kind of the multi-threaded support and latency. Yeah. And so we yeah. there's there's definitely some work around. Uh, getting our MIDI plugin, our OSC plugin, for that matter, yeah. to be able to clock, uh, you know. If you don't know, OSC is Open Android. Sound Control, which is kind of like, it's like MIDI but uses networking and a little bit different. But we we uh, it's actually a lot different than MIDI. But anyways, uh, I would probably think about MIDI support as to control the inputs, input parameters. So yeah. you could say like, here's you know filter frequency cutoff. Now bind it to a knob and then go like. Yeah. Kind that was thing. one of the that's probably what i would do yeah we did rec yeah. receive a lot of questions in regards to how can i use midi to control the input parameters so, yeah. so right now in ea out of the box use the midi plugin in blueprint and then just drive the drive the values directly value the, from yeah. blueprint. so the like because it's all those inputs are exposed to blueprint you can do at that point you can yeah. map it to anything that have we detailed supports. in the documentation for meta sounds in ufrl access how to drive input parameters through yeah it's in the docs Okay, yeah, yeah. perfect. I just wanted to make sure so that we don't have to go through it on yeah, the Yeah, the docs, uh, we actually have a dedicated docs uh, writer. Mm -hmm. He joined us a couple months ago before it was like a contractor and it was it was hard to get docs out, but he's been really up on it. So actually MetaSound docs for a crazy feature like that are pretty decent yep. relative I, to other releases. I just want to caveat it though. That's, you know, <laughs> that's obviously running at the game, uh, the game thread tick, yes. right? Which is yes. not the block rate. Um, and... Slower. It's or slower, it's, or at least different. <laughs> yeah, at least different, and and there will be latency passing that data along, and so those are some of the places. So like the that. the default MetaSound block rate, which is what everything's using now, is 100 frames per second to yeah. give you an idea. But that's there's a CVAR that you can set to change that, so you can hear what it what its impact is. But we would, like I said, uh, like to expose that as a format parameter on MetaSound, yeah. so each MetaSound can have their custom block rate. Again, again, the scaffolding's there. It's just yeah, a matter of exposing and it. massaging it a little bit. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and then. And then providing the ability for the the MIDI plugin or, or whatever MIDI implementation yeah. you know to effectively run uh, at that block rate um, yeah. to and and potentially directly access that data so that TLDR it, though is like, that your MIDI issues. input into Blueprint is going to get event quantized to the yeah. game thread update tick yeah. then have to go and communicate through from the game thread to the audio thread then to the audio render thread so which might so, be a little bit of a might add uncomfortable latency but it's not too bad especially with like playing notes on yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yep. awesome. Um, is it possible to use meta sound outputs to drive game logic? Yes. Uh, now, no, <laughs> but it is possible <laughs> uh, through audio parameter modulation. That would be probably the cleanest and most generic way to do it. So, in other words, a meta sound could write into a parameter bus, and then the parameter bus could be read from from gameplay arbitrarily. Yeah. So yeah. that's probably the the path that we're going to use in the future. Parameter buses are the key thing. Now, you could ga drive gameplay logic off of uh you know, envelope following and things like that that already exist. Uh but there isn't a very it's not like a Quartz has a kind of like notification system like hey, it's a blue it's a it's a beat and then you can kind of get a blueprint event off of that. We don't have that kind of a thing yet off of MetaSound. So that's a good question. There was someone was curious, you know, they're they're looking at meta sounds and they're thinking like, well, I just want to play one spatial last sound, you know, inside my scene. Um, how complex is that? They were sort of curious. I was wondering if you could just show us. If that. you just want to play a single sound, mm -hmm. loop it. We still have support for use sound wave playback, so just like import your sound, drag it into level, it still works. Yep. Um, and then what? with the idea of a preset, uh, so like right now, like sound if you know sound cues. There's there's sort of like a a thing where you're like just randomly pick from this list of options and then play it and then that's it. So with the meta sound, you would just have a, a we would probably ship it like I said with like meta sound utilities like in 5.0 we would just make a bunch of stuff that right off the bat. So it would be like meta sound random picker. Yeah. You know, or like random meta sound would be your meta sound, and then you wouldn't even have to write it. You would just play it and then just say which variations you want. Now here's an interesting issue with our inputs. So uh, sound cues, uh, if you're familiar with it, to, to do a random variation choice in a sound cue, the random nodes, the like variations, are what I would call topologically relevant, which means that the topology of the sound cue is different depending on the number of variations you have. So in other words, like each variation is a node, 
which is a really serious problem. <laughs> like, that's one of the original sins of sound cues. We have a thing called sound cue templates that we use for Fortnite uh, that is was is basically working around this problem because, like, the, the sound designers on Fortnite will, like, make a gun template that's a sound cue. They'll write the sound cue up, and then we actually put some effort into automatically generating a template, but it because of this topology problem, it's really complicated. Uh, so we just, to buy us more time to work on meta sounds we just sort of said hey uh ryan ryan there's our uh, gameplay audio programmer on fortnite for like it's really easy to c plus plus the sound cue template so it takes him like five ten minutes to write up a template and we've probably got like a dozen sound cue templates on fortnite now something like that anyways the point is is that we've that that topology relevancy is a huge problem for meta sounds it's just an array and so the array is not topologically relevant right it's not a separate node which is really powerful because you can say like randomly pick from this array of things and it's the same meta sound right uh the problem is this is a general ux issue in the ue editor adding elements to arrays kind of sucked right so like you have to like say plus and then drag an element to add it to it and it's, and it's really painful like when i did my demo with the procedural drums i had like 32 variants on like snare drums and i was sitting there dragging each element oh i'm like oh god this sucks <laughs> we have a request into the editor team to support multi drag and drop to arrays so you could select like eight things drag it onto the array and it just populates it and i know that would be something that everybody would want yeah. but and they're aware of it we're probably going to end up writing it because we desperately need it for our so meta sound workflow. There, there are so forms. We'll probably of just that. end up writing that support. <laughs> there, there are yeah. forms of it, but there's, there's kind of like if you have a struct of a, of a reference yeah. or something or multiple structs, then it's there's not some caveats to it. And in the caveats end up ultimately like kind of nerfing its yeah. ability in most cases. And, and but you could have a special customized case it. Yeah, we have a customized editor view yes. for our waves, for instance, and it and because it's customized, we lose that support. So. There's some, there's yeah. definitely some massaging to that code that needs to get done. But anyways, having multi support for drag and drop of assets would make a huge Across impact on our, our variations, yep. or on just making meta sounds. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah. anyways, long story short, or shorter, longer story, less long, but or whatever. Uh, the idea is he will be able to just do his bread and butter stuff. We are aware of bread and butter applications. Yep. And eventually, we kind of want to dismantle a little bit of sound waves as well, move away any of the the runtime yeah. behavior that is encap you know data that's encapsulated on a sound wave off of that. So, you know, at the end of the day, we want yeah. a, like a U sound um, at some point or something like that yeah. that'll effectively just have asset information. Um, so what, what Rob's getting at is right now this is a legacy thing. Uh, when you drag an asset in from your desktop into UE. It creates a U sound wave asset, which is a playable asset, which has like runtime play data. The problem with that is that you actually want to decouple your imported asset data from the runtime data about how to play it. Um, and so we want to create a thing that's like a U sound asset that lets you have features around just managing assets. And it would deal with like format conversion, you know, compression quality, sample previewing, rate, et cetera, yeah. sample rate, all that kind of stuff. And it would be like read only. And like, that's the thing that gets cooked. And then decouple that from something that would be like a you today a U sound wave would just be like play this sound, you know, um, the simple and attenuation would, settings and yeah. And, right. So in other words, like a meta sound list, just play the sound one variant. There, so we want to support that that like ultra simple bread and butter case. Yep. Um, yeah, because and there is some confusion on that as well. Like when you drag a sound wave into a meta sound, and that has you know. Uh, by extension, attenuation settings. Well, we, we yes. ignore the attenuation settings. Yes. Really, we're just using yes. the cooked data there. Yes. So just to clarify that, you know, like... Oh, so that's a really good point. I drag this thing in with attenuation, then I play it. Well, all that information's lost. Well, that currently is the only way in UE5 to get cooked wa yes. sound wave data. It's so, a huge problem. Yeah. So eventually so, that U sound asset will probably be the, the only thing, you know... So to, to, of, to reiterate that, just so it's super clear, when you have a U sound wave in the editor, you can double click it and add attenuation and all these kinds of stuff, which are like runtime modifications of the imported asset data. And that's the problem that we're saying exists. Like we want to decouple that so that it's very clear that this is just the asset and then this is a runtime data. When you play that sound in a meta sound, we're just grabbing the asset data because there's no way for the meta sound to know anything about the attenuation. Attenuation is a game thread concept or it's really an audio thread concept it's not a rendering thing and so for us to then support attenuation like the higher level asset does would be a huge breaking of what we're trying we to do heard. with meta sounds yep. so uh basically the the way to conceptualize it is that the meta sound itself 
is the sound cue output. And then that whole meta sound could then get attenuated. So when you go to play the meta sound source, applying attenuation on that will attenuate the whole sound. You got to think about meta sounds as the as the rendering of the sound source. There's a lot of other other subtle implications with this, which are huge. For example, uh, one more thing. I know it's you wanted short answers, but when you play a sound no, cue, when you play a sound cue, and you there's a thing called a mixer node, and you say play this sound, play this sound, and then they play them all at once. That mixer node is not actually mixing audio. When I first started at Epic six years ago, I was like, oh my god, this is so confusing to people. What it's doing is just playing multiple sounds and the audio renderer definitely is mixing it, but it's not getting mixed in the sound queue. And so it actually will take up multiple slots in your in your like audio rendering sort of voice pool. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into details, but when you play a sound, it takes up a slot. It's like, here, this is rendering a sound. And so for a sound queue that's playing multiple sounds, that can get really complicated to think about concurrency. Concurrency is like how many sounds are playing at once. It's really difficult to mix. It's it changes based on other so like your meta sound or your sound cue that you created might change at the runtime because in the editor it's nice and clean there's only one playing but if you have multiple of those playings which actual sound in that mixer node is actually played is up to the sort of default you know concurrency management because we can only play for example 32 sounds or 64 sounds or however your project is defined and so it needs to make a decision of how many sources can i support so with meta sounds it is one source period so that could cause a CPU problem if you're trying to play 7 billion sounds in your meta sound. But in terms of a mixing thing, it's guaranteed to sound exactly like you made it in your meta sound. So if you made your meta sound, there's no concern. If that meta sound is playing, it will sound like it did in your... There's no weird thing off the fact. It's like one sound, one meta sound is one sound slot, um, which is really subtle but important distinction that it's just a significant improvement of, of meta sounds over sound cues. It's subtle, but it's important. If you're if you're an audio nerd listening to this, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Continuing. Sorry. Uh, what was that? No, no, no. Please keep the excitement going. Yeah. Um, uh, there are a few more that I, I, I do want to cover. Um, let's see here. Uh, one learner was wondering: Are MetaSounds frequency capped or full spectrum possible? I don't. I, I don't know what that means. Like is sample rate? I mean, it's the sample rate. So. The MetaSound sample rate right now is, I think, the same sample rate as the audio render. Do you remember what the sample rate, Rob, what it is? Um, it's like 48K or something. I can't remember if it's independent or if it uses the same sample rate as the meta, as the audio yeah. render. But quote-unquote full spectrum is, is I, I can't compute what that means uh, because digital audio is not full spectrum. So it's dependent on the sample rate. So briefly, the highest frequency you can represent uh, in digital audio is half the sample rate. And so if you're at 48K, that's 24 kilohertz audio that you can represent. So, but full spectrum is infinite. <laughs> so it's it's capped based on the sample rate. And yes, you can adjust the sample rate. Like I said, we want meta sounds to support changing their sample rate. So you could have, and by the way, sample rate is a, one of the key things that is CPU bound, right? The higher the sample rate, the more samples per second, the more math that happens per second, the bigger the CPU usage. And so you actually want to have the smallest sample rate you can get away with without causing problems. 48K and 44.1K are the standard, and that's what I think it defaults to. But you can imagine on iOS or Android that you might want to actually, if you want to use the power of MetaSounds, cut that down. Like a, a, a 24K might be actually, even though it seems really slow, it actually might be reasonable for most assets. Most people have high frequency hearing loss. I know I do, <laughs> but most people do. And so your higher frequency elements might, for most people start dropping off around 12K. So 24K sample rate is actually a reasonable sample rate. Yeah. And, and that's half the CPU cost. In fact, every time you hear a little ringing that's temporary in one of your ears, that's the last time you can hear that frequency because that's literally the serenade that your cells are doing, right? I think that's Celia. wrong. I've I've read that. That's, that's, that's I think that's a wives' tale. tale. So that's I've heard that it's a Celia, like dying or something. But I think you have multiple Celia that represent a particular frequency. So perhaps it's your ability ish. to f just uh, to slowly dying. Complete, yeah, yeah, completely <laughs> recognize that frequency. I always Otherwise, think I'd it, always. What if your ears are constantly ringing? Does that just mean you're just constantly losing that frequency? That's, then you got tinnitus, and you should probably go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. No, I my ears don't ring, but I definitely have that hiss. There's like, so it's, it's like early onset tinnitus. Um, so I spend all day with freaking headphones. Um, next question comes from Gal Ramirez is wondering, can you pass values to meta sounds using C++? 
Uh, you mean like a C++ API? Yeah, you could. Basically, the, the same interface that we use for setting stuff for blueprints. I mean, just like anything, you could just have some native code that sets it. So, yeah. Let's see. And uh, Lively Geek was wondering, is it possible to basically create meta sounds in C++ or is it limited to the uh, editor? So uh, you mean like author the node graph in C++ directly? I don't know if you'd want to do that. I don't know what benefit there would be to it. Uh, however, um, there is this idea of nativization. This came up. So like, so first of all, meta sounds are already native. Like I said, there's not, it's not a it's not a scripting language. When you're executing the meta sound graph, it's pure C++ right yeah. off the bat. So there isn't uh, any kind of bytecode. There's not like an overhead like blueprints. It's just the overhead in meta sounds is the overhead of C++, which yeah. could exist. <laughs> there is overhead to C++. And so you may make a beautiful meta sound graph, profile it. By the way, that's one thing we haven't talked about. We do have lots of plans for profiling and CPU profiling. And we're actually kicking off a big tool right now. We're calling uh, Audio Insights. It's going to be a thing. Um, but we also want to have in-graph profiling and kind of so like, so like while you're doing your meta sound stuff. Be able to probe things, not on Yeah, you're able to probe stuff. Friends. How much does it cost CPU? Like color coding put in cpu mode and like this node is kind of expensive and we have those that those kind of plans we are aware of the cpu thing um but you can imagine building a meta sound graph where that just the overhead of even in c plus plus of just you know graphs and stuff and you you might think i could optimize this i could take this graph and put it in cmd and make it really fast you could totally do that it's very easy to make new meta sound nodes so you could nativize your complicated meta sound graph by hand and turn it into just optimized c plus plus code and we, this is probably down the way. There's some analysis that we could do. One of the const we we add constraints to meta sounds like acyclical nature and those kind of stuff, where we can do some CPU optimizations like pruning graph uh, subgraphs. So be like, oh, this subgraph is not getting called right now because it's we can sort of understand how the graph is laid out, um, and we can say like actually don't execute this branch and do kind of pruning of stuff like that. We have a little bit of that already. We had to disable some of it um, as we brought in. Um some some of the more recent features but um but yeah to your point like uh it's it's every every graph is a node under the hood yep. um the core is completely decoupled from from like the ue reflection yep. system and serialization um there are different levels in which you could actually write your own but yep. but typically what we would recommend and we want to create tools down the road to make this easier would be to write your own node um, and then use that graph as reference and whatever underlying you know c plus plus functionality there uh, you know, build a library out of that. We have our own yep. DSP library that we reference constantly, and yep. we've been trying to push more and more too, so that it's more easily shareable across the entire yep. audio engine. Um, that's kind of the design paradigm that. Yeah, we try to probably recommend put into libraries any kind of stuff that we do for SIMD kind of work anything. Um, the other point to make on this, this is a subtle thing that uh, it's a maybe no one's going to ask it, but there's in game audio there's this idea of virtualization. Uh, we have some kind of idea of it in UE, but it's like fake virtualization. Uh, virtual voices is something that we would have been wanting to support for a while, but now with meta sounds, it's kind of an interesting question. Like, what does a virtual meta sound even mean? What is it? What does that? What does that even sound like? Um, so, virtual sound, uh, if it was just like a regular play a sound thing, it would operate basically as like you wouldn't actually render or decode the audio, but you would update its state as if it was rendering audio, and then when the the source decides to become quote unquote real, it would like seek to where it would have been if it was playing and then start rendering audio from that point of on, point on. And so for a single sound, that's just a sound wave. That makes sense. You're like, oh, that's cool. But what does it mean for a procedurally generated graph to do virtualization? So we've been thinking about this. Uh, hopefully we'll have it by 5.0. It's probably a stretch, uh, yeah. but we might we might want to think about it. But the big idea is to have, uh, right now in a meta sounds rendered, there's this function under the hood called execute. So we're thinking about having a function called virtual execute, which then allows nodes to decide for themselves what they want to do on a virtual execution. So for a wave player, virtual execute, it would be very analogous to just a normal virtual call where it's like, you know, don't actually render or decode the sound, but update your state so that when you become real, you know where to start playing from. Keep um, but, track of the duration, whatever, you know. Exactly. But you could also have like a filter during. that's not actually generating filter audio, but it updates its state as if it was rendering audio. Yep. And so it's like basically cheap execute versus expensive execute. And then the whole meta sound could be in virtual mode. And then the meta sound could drop its CPU cost to almost nothing. It still would have some overhead, just like regular virtual voices do. But then you could have like sort of virtual mode and then flip it to real and that kind of thing. So there's some experimental ideas. 
I don't think anybody is doing anything like that. I don't know of anybody doing like a DSP audio graph virtual call, but it makes sense and I think it could work. Awesome. Um, any chance we get to see some VST compatibility? So uh, VST compatibility doesn't make a lot of sense with MetaSounds directly, but we are thinking about VST as a thing big time uh, in UE. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it now. We've been sort of, it's not secret. There's a tool we're working on called AudioLink, uh, which is a plugin in an a uh, API that we're working on. Uh, Jimmy Smith on my team is working on it. So AudioLink is our intention of creating a way for UE to communicate with systems outside of UE, including VST, potentially FMOD, potentially WISE, et cetera. And so we actually have a prototype working right now where we've uh, uh, actually got audio in UE rendering it within, within WISE which is very exciting. So people, there's a lot of wise users who sell meta sounds and are like, oh man, I really want to use meta sounds, but I'm using wise because of whatever. I've got a five year game project, et cetera. So, <clears throat> and so we would like to let people use meta sounds within wise. And so that's what audio links about. And one of the link targets that we want to be able to target is VSTs. And so it could be that uh, you're, you could write a VST plugin that renders its audio directly into UE using audio link and or vice versa to have uh, UE audio rendering into a VST plugin. Yeah. Now, whether or not we execute the MetaSound graph within the VST, it's technically possible because MetaSounds, like I said, are decoupled from the engine. The problem is, is the editor and all that stuff is part of UE. And, et cetera. and yeah. we probably, having all of UE... <laughs> within a VST plugin would probably be your most expensive VST plugin that you've ever made, you know, but it's technically possible. You could make a VST plugin, which wraps Unreal Engine editor or something. I don't know. And it's possible. Clear, <laughs> and to be clear, like audio link and, and you're, you're speaking to communication as in yeah. like uh, being able to mix audio to other applications. Yes. That's what I mean. Them. Like yeah. audio specifically, obviously we can communicate using OSC and MIDI. Yes. And we're we, going to support that, that more richly in the future. You can even do that with OSC supports transmitting audio, but I mean like a deep communication, like, yeah. so Ableton live, for example, has max for Transport live. Um, and it, yeah. there, there is an exciting idea of doing something crazy. That's like meta sounds for live. You know, you can imagine like making your medicine graph within Ableton live or something. That's likely not going to happen anytime soon, uh, but it's technically possible. Uh, probably a, an earlier version would be to have a, that we would make a UE plugin that lets you just grab your audio from your VST and feed it directly into a meta sound or into the Unreal Engine. Um, there's a lot of interesting applications for that. And obviously not limited to VSTs, audio units, other like... Yeah, yeah. You know, it's audio plugins. Plugins in general. Yeah. The target... So Juice is a really well-known um, third-party C++ API for audio development, and they have a thing called Juicer, which lets you target multiple audio plugin formats. One of the dreams or ideas to make uh, UE uh, a plugin target format, so you could make your thing in Juice and then be able to compile it for a UE plugin. It's one idea. And also potentially make like a sort of audio link. There's lots of ideas. We're aware of all these things. There, we just don't have unlimited time and resources. <laughs> uh, but... Yes. I can't hear you anymore. Victor. No, I was muted because I didn't oh, hit my foot pedal. <laughs> I, and I can tell myself. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, is it possible to use a live microphone with Meta Sounds? So uh, we have something in UE called an audio com uh, microphone component or mic component. Um, I don't see why we wouldn't be able, certainly not now, we haven't written support for it, but we did, we have written kind of an early version of a uh, wave writer. So in MetaSound, you can write to a wave file. And so microphone input would be the invert of that. I don't know how much utility or like the UX on that from, from a runtime perspective would be pretty hard. Like how, you know, however, uh, you could make a thing which is like audio buffer as input. And it'd be interesting from Blueprint, this is... So again, this is speculation mode. It'd be interesting if you could connect in some abstract way, like here's here's an audio input somehow. <laughs> Maybe a parameter modulation might have an... We have something called audio buses too, by the way. Um, it's sort of the audio rate version of a parameter bus. Audio buses are, are really powerful. Um, and that's something we also want to integrate into MetaSound so people could write into and read from audio buses and kind of connect them all around the editor. So you could imagine uh, from Blueprint, you have a microphone component writing into an audio bus, which is an abstract thing, and then have that audio bus's output go into MetaSound. And that would probably be the route that I would take it, just because having microphone component directly in it, you have to start thinking, which microphone device? How does it work at runtime? How do you, you know, there's all comp complicated things. Pl but if you just make it specific. generic, like 
audio bus. I want to read from it. I want to do stuff from it. And then you say, where's the audio bus source coming from? Oh, it happens to be this microphone, or it could be from a BST plugin, or it could be from anywhere. Um, that's the sort of generic way of thinking about it architecturally. Now, what's interesting to point on this, the uh, audio, uh, so Synesthesia is another plugin that we've written, which is about uh, audio analysis. I've added real-time capabilities to audio synesthesia for early access. That's actually what is driving that widget in the MetaSound graph. That's like sort of the amplitude envelope. So what that's actually through audio synesthesia. That is a real-time analyzer through audio synesthesia using audio buses. So that is actually the beginning of this architecture of audio buses like I'm talking about. So the way it's, it works is that in the, in the MetaSound editor, there is a like prototype MetaSound object in C++, which is like your like preview MetaSound. And that's what we're like stuffing. When you push play in the editor, we're actually grabbing that graph and stuffing it into the preview MetaSound. And what I've done is made the MetaSound output route to an audio bus, that preview editor. And that audio bus then is connected to the widget. And then the widget through synesthesia. So it's like audio bus, go to synesthesia, do some analysis, get the results back, feed that analysis results to this generic widget. And that's how it works. So we want to build sort of this audio analysis synesthesia paradigm off of audio buses to make it really generic. So now that that widget can be controlled by anything, we could add it to wherever, whatever point, because audio buses are, are abstract and arbitrary. So you could think of an audio bus as like a really lightweight submix that doesn't yeah, do anything it's, by it's default. It's basically an asset wrapper for yes. uh, like controlling an audio buffer. With yes. some, it literally, I think, only has like uh, output it's very format simple. on it. <laughs> like yes. It's literally an asset with an output format. Very, very yeah, simple. It's very, very simple. Um, and anything can write into them. And anything can read from them from any thread. They're a very powerful concept. And so um, we're using them to do side chaining. We've got some early stuff where we're side chaining uh, audio compressors from it. So you could say drive this compressor with this audio bus, side chain it, drive another. Pr so audio buses are going to be a very, very powerful concept within MetaSounds and elsewhere. It's like turning UE into, if you see behind me, I'm, I'm into modular synthesis. <laughs> uh, it's turning Unreal Engine into sort of modular synthesis where, you know, patch cords and cables can have audio and parameters. And it's like this creative space. Um, but it's an it's an evolution of concepts over time. So, and obviously reading it from any thread means, you know, you depending upon the thread speed, like yes. uh, the rate, it some latency. It, it, latency, drop packets, yeah. whatever, but... Um, shouldn't be drop packets, but there might be latency. But yeah. that's that's the it's cost fair. of yeah, software. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the cost of software. But um, anyways, any other questions? Yes, we got more, and I'll keep going as long as you guys are good with it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, can do, can do another 20 minutes or so. Uh, another question from uh, Robin Hasenbach, who's wondering, are there platform limitations for MetaSounds? Does no. it work on mobile? Yeah, that's... So our audio renderer is uh, multi-platform. It works on all platforms. It's, the way that works is we just render audio, and then the output gets fed through a thin layer to the hardware. So there are platform limitations, but they're more in the, the realm of like memory and CPU limits. But the fundamental capabilities are the same. So on Fortnite, for example, it's the same audio renderer everywhere. So when we do a cool feature, like for example, we have a feature where the user can like through voice processing or whatever, can have like something happen that changes their voice output. I think we used it for Fort Nightmares last year. I think they used it recently for some alien thing. Anyways, uh, so that's the same across platforms and VoIP works everywhere. So uh, source effects, apply. anyways, there's no limitation. It's just your CPU constraint. Is there any way that you can output a meta sound as or export as a WAV file? So that's what I mentioned. We have WAV file writer right now. It only supports like a single channel writing to file. We've been using it as a debugging tool because like you're like, what's that click or pop? What's happening? And so we write it to disk within the graph and you can kind of tap in and analyze stuff. So it's it's called WAV writer, I think. But uh, we want to support generic versions of that. But then outside of that, we already have feature support for writing arbitrary audio to disk. So uh, within submixes from Blueprint, you can say there's like a, a submix API that lets you write to disk from any submix. So the only way you hear anything is that the audio is playing out on a submix. Submixes are how you actually hear anything. And there's a default master submix. So if you haven't thought about it, it's just going to your master. Um, and so you can actually write to disk outside of any submix, including master. So even outside the box, it inherited the ability to write to disk. 
Yeah, it's probably um, not a bad idea to add like a little more rich UX experience around that too. We could add like a real simple tool. Around the editor, we could do that. Yeah. Like you could have uh, a yeah, thing that's yeah, like absolutely. record to disk and like, you know, so you, while you're editing, you could imagine like sort of a control thing to just like take snapshots, like record yeah. or even like performance mode. Because I can imagine meta sounds are really fun. Yeah. And as we start getting more and more knobs and controllers, you could imagine a kind of, especially with MIDI inputs, yeah, I can totally absolutely. see a world where people perform meta sounds live. Like yep. it's some kind of crazy, <laughs> yep, absolutely. like using a UE editor is like a live performance tool which yeah. is insane but you could totally imagine yep, that. that's not far-fetched and and even <laughs> outside of the editor too i mean obviously all that umg support is available in a packaged game yeah the sounds are in packaged games like we could we could very well create that could be part of our audio widget library at some point there might be a little bit of crossover there with the synesthesia stuff too yeah so, yeah. so one one of the things like my background is computer music and creative coding I have done actual shows where I've coded in front of people and <laughs> performed <laughs> music. So I could totally see that as a use case paradigm eventually with MetaSounds in the editor. It would be really cool to go that go to that level. Another question from Robin yeah. Hasenbach, and maybe we can iterate a little bit on this, but is there a way to, to um, see the performance of MetaSounds at runtime? So right now you just use regular old Unreal Insights. You'll see it. <laughs> Uh, the, we've been met, we've been tracking it right now. The performance bottleneck is on the compilation step, so we're actually working with Chris Zuko in the community. He's got uh, if you check out his stuff, he is what's it called Project Mix. Check him out on Twitter. It is crazy. So he's been working for a while on this his pet like his pet project. He's actually a tech director on in an indie company right now, but he, for fun, he's making this insanely awesome little tool and. He had already written all this stuff before MetaSounds came out, and then an EA uh, early access. He was like, "What happens if I do this for for MetaSounds?" And he's like playing for you know, it's this whole procedural like it's it's like a music authoring system. It's beautiful and he's it's amazing. But it, he ended up exposing like our bottleneck, our perf bottleneck, which we ended up not having to worry about in the early access uh uh, uh keep forgetting, uh, ancient game thing. The issue is uh, we actually compile the MetaSound graph when it goes to play um, in Blueprint. And we're, there's a lot of stuff we're working on that, but it's actually runtime compiling the MetaSound graph to the C++, basically translating it from the sort of front front end JSON representation to pure C++. It's actually doing that compilation at runtime, which is obviously not great. Uh, so we've actually cut that down by 30x uh, already. We're checking in the optimizations for that. And then obviously doing some stuff to amortize the cost even more, possibly even doing it at cook time. There's some benefits to doing it at runtime. There's a lot of benefits to doing it at runtime, but we'll probably end up having a cook time version of that. Um, and so stuff like that. But anyways, that's the perf bottleneck. The actual runtime has, has not shown up as being a big issue. Uh, obviously, since MetaSound is unbounded in terms of what you can do, you could kill your CPU perf with just one MetaSound. But through reasonable usages, like even the graph I showed you today, it shouldn't show up as like a... For, you have to think about the number of instances you're going to have on a, on a meta sound. What I just played is one of them is probably fine. But if you were to do like a hundred of them, it would probably stack up uh, just because there's a lot of mixing and filtering and things like that. It's, but for bread and butter cases like footsteps, gunshots, things like that, it shouldn't show up in your perf. Uh, it shouldn't be a big issue. Uh, th though we're looking at those things. We have we use regular old Unreal Insights to look at the perf. Um, again, it's generated asynchronously, so... It's the your background tasks um, it uses the task graph. It'll stuff the meta sound generation where it makes sense. Um, it should make sense, but perf is a complicated thing. Like I said, we want to do audio insights. Audio insights will basically take regular un Unreal Insights and expand on it and allow you to have a whole bunch of audio specific metrics, like how many sources you're running, how many you know, what are audio events that have happened? So you'll be able to drill down exactly why something's taking a lot. You could just look at it off the bat, like, oh, some, something's going on crazy. <laughs> but it'd be cool to be able to say it's going crazy because it's playing like 50 sounds and here's the sound that it's playing. And, you know, here's the actor that's, called, you know, that kind of drilling down so you can get better details uh, from an audio perspective. We've been looking at a lot of uh, profilers from the competition, Wise, uh, Unity's audio profiler and stuff like that. So we do have a lot of tools for debugging and profiling that are sort of more legacy and we've kind of slowly evolved those. Those are around like CVARs and stat displays and memory logging and things like that. But we want to make a comprehensive, easy to use audio profiler tool. Uh, that's definitely on our list. All right, and to wrap up, 
what is there anything you want to drop that sort of I know you talked a little bit about what's to come what you're working yeah. on um, is there anything that you haven't mentioned today that you'd like to leave with the community in regards to what's next for uh, meta sounds and audio in Unreal Engine I think I've literally said everything did I leave anything out Rob nope that's everything I think that's I've literally engine. laid on the table what are that's what the I wrote rest of it. our lives <laughs> it's like what I described is probably like five to ten years of work it is a lot of work to do everything I said that we want to do yep. um, the team just so you guys know like uh, the, the, our team is is not small. Uh, how many people? How many audio programs we got? Uh, six or seven. Seven. Uh, seven. We have a dedicated UDN support uh, engineer, Anna, who's awesome. So she's on UDN, but she's doing features and stuff as well. Uh, we have a gameplay audio programmer uh, on Fortnite, which is great because he's actually writing features for Fortnite, but putting them in plugins. So, th so for, I'll, I'll announce some of the things that he's working on that I think the community too. would be into. So one of the things that Ryan is working on is a comprehensive refactoring of the audio volume system. Um, what does he call it? Ambient? What, do you, what does he call it? I forget. Uh, I think it's just audio. called an audio volume system, isn't it? No, he, there's a... He, audio volumes? Ambient volumes? Maybe? Anyways, I can't remember. There's a name for it, but... Uh, it's a comprehensive, really amazing refactor of how that system works. It's more kind of component driven, similar to kind of like Unity components. So you define an audio volume and then you can per feature add what you want to happen when you're in that volume. So right now audio volumes work. It's a very legacy kind of like hard coded thing. I've sort of slammed in a couple features to buy us time for a comprehensive refactor of that system. Like in 426, you can do stuff with submixing, like cross fading submix chains and things like that now which is like kind of connecting the final submixes are powerful but with audio volumes now you can actually really finely tune control submix stuff but it's still kind of a fungly hard-coded old way of thinking the about volume stuff. the volume system was originally just for like reverb right like it wasn't thinking about no it does or... reverb the old legacy stuff was just like reverb zones it, and it would apply EQ and it would like yeah. do volume attenuation yeah and it was like all hard-coded yeah so we made it so it's like Plugins can extend what you want to do in a vault. It's basically a really comprehensive audio oriented ge audio geometry thing, and it's amazing. Right. They're using it on for a lot sub, of really cool stuff. Mixes more specifically. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Like they're, they're they're using it for all kinds of interesting audio things. Like if you play Fortnite, I re if you're into audio, play for and, and UE audio. Just play Fortnite to pay attention to what audio stuff's going on there because it's really cutting edge. They're they're literally on the bleeding edge of a lot of really cool stuff that we're doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing he's working on, which is really cool, is called Audio Libraries, uh, which basically it's a feature a lot of WISE users have asked us for, where they're like, one of the things that WISE does is have kind of a, a sort of hierarchy of sounds. So you can be like, this sound propagates to this and this and this, and it kind of creates this sort of folder hierarchy. So you can like override something at the top and it kind of propagates down. We're never going to do something exactly like that in UE because just how assets work. We don't have hierarchical assets in the same way. But the sound design use case that's cited as one of the powerful things about that is being able to like swap out whole like sound design sets based on runtime data. And so uh, audio libraries basically get that. And they're using it on Fortnite for like custom gear. You swap out your shoes and and your, you know, cloak you're wearing or whatever, whatever. You know, character Foley can be very dynamic in Fortnite now. And so what they can do is like mark up an actor with events and have those propagate down based on state of what sounds to play and it kind of just inherits and it's a kind of a, a library hierarchical system it's pretty cool the sound designers on fortnite love it and they've made this plugin um and we're gonna the idea is to also bring this over to the engine so it's really exciting to have a gameplay audio programmer trying to solve very concrete specific problems and he's a very good programmer so we're kind of making sure that when he does a feature we can generalize it and help the community it's not necessarily the case across the board uh, for Fortnite feature development, but we're trying really hard so that any work he does, we can leverage for the community. Um, another thing, for example, that just we added support for, I can't remember if I made it out for 427, is user customizable audio device hot swapping. So from Blueprint, you can actually say which hardware device you want to swap to. Um, yeah, we added that for Fortnite. Uh, Ryan helped us get you know get it out to the world. So that's actually a feature that that's exists huge. on Fortnite now. Yeah, so we've had it for a while where it could hot swap from the OS. You could say, like, change your default, and it would swap to that. And there's lots of complicated – it's a pain in the butt to support that. Um, and then we added it so that you can cuss, you can choose which device you want. And so that's hooked up now to Fortnite user preferences. So so theoretically, um, this was actually requested and driven by an executive. It was funny. 
got a, 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 a Dan Vogel. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you, Dan Vogel, anyways, he's playing Fortnite, and he pings us, and he's like, I was playing this, and I can't... The, so the VoIP system lets you select which output you want your VoIP to go on, or where your input and your output. And he's like, why can't the audio engine? And I was like, oh, the VoIP is actually using a different... It's like kind of decoupled from the audio render intentionally. We worked with the with the EOS team and a lot of that stuff, and it's very intentionally decoupled. But uh, and so now that they have support for rendering to arbitrary devices, there we had to add it for the general engine, and it was kind of funny. It was like executive driven <laughs> feature request. I was like, all right, we got to do it. Uh, see what else? Other random stuff. I can't think of anything. Oh, uh, the other thing too is we have uh, so Epic purchased Psyonix. And so we have an audio programmer over there, and we actually uh, had an open headcount to help them. So we're getting another audio programmer there. So they're going to have two audio programmers, which is great. So Cyanix, which does Rocket League. Shout out um, to Miles Flanagan. Yeah, and so Rocket League, the next version of Rocket League, is switching from WISE to native audio. So that's a very ambitious project, um, and it's really exciting. Um, we love working with that team. They're a really, really good audio team. And uh, so the, any features that they write are going to help the general community. And I think um, some stuff has already gone out. Miles actually, uh, Miles Flanagan, uh, we borrowed him for a little bit on the EA, and he wrote a couple of MetaSound nodes and helped us out with the uh, Valley of the Ancients. He wrote some of the audio plugins that Valley of the Ancients used. So really great programmer. So anyways, we got a team going, and it's great. Uh, and we also have two interns this year, two really awesome interns. They've uh, They've been doing a lot of MetaSounds work. One of them is starting, kicking off the uh, Audio Insights plugin, and uh, the other one's just been pumping out really cool MetaSound nodes and UE5 main. So we got a lot of a lot of great work going on. It's very exciting. Yep, and obviously our QA too, Sandra is awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sandra. Embedded. I, I should mention their names. So uh, 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 our interns are Alfaro and Helen, were awesome, and then Sandra's are uh, embedded uh, audio QA analyzer and al analyzer and analyst. She joined us about when 426 was shipping, and I asked her to be on the on the call today, uh, but she uh, wasn't able to do it. But uh, Sandra is just amazing. I think she has been absolutely crucial for our help for uh, helping us to actually ship Meta Sounds in as solid of a state as it is for early access. I kind of wanted her on the on the call just to talk about her experience of like. <laughs> You know, working with the team of people trying to shove stuff in last minute. Getting, getting. Valley of the Ancients was a crazy project to work on. I will say yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and then Phil, obviously Phil Pop oh, yeah. is our other yeah. senior audio programmer uh, with yeah. the majority of time on Medicine. He's pretty much one of the, the the brainchilds of it with you, Aaron, and uh, our R.I.P. Ethan Geller. <laughs> yeah, Ethan. Ethan worked did a lot of work on Medicines. Uh, he left to join Facebook or last year. But uh, um, but Phil, I would call him actually our principal audio programmer now. Yeah. I don't know if it's official yet, but I was trying to give him a promotion. He's basically our MetaSound architect on a lot of the lower level okay. stuff. He's a uh, genius. Yeah, he's really, really he's good. one of the most humble geniuses I've ever met. He's, he's one awesome. of the smartest people I have ever met in my life is Phil. Uh, I, we actually Phil and I met in in grad school like 11 years ago, and I've been trying to get him to join. So he went off not into games. He went off into like fancy DSP research land. And I've convinced him to come into games, and I'm really glad I did. <laughs> uh, I love Phil. Phil's great. And then, uh, do we, oh, Max. And then Max Hayes, he couldn't make you here, but he came from DigiPen. He was an intern that we converted. Uh, and Max is just doing great. He's the main architect for Quartz. Quartz. And uh, he's been doing a lot of work right now recently on submixes and that kind of stuff. So did I leave anybody out? We're trying to highlight our team here. I, now I can't leave anybody out. Am I forgetting anybody? I think, oh, Dan Reynolds, of course. So you guys know Dan Reynolds in the community. He's not an audio programmer, but he actually is programs. Uh, he's very technical. He was also going to be on the on the call today. Actually, Rob is a sub for Dan, uh, because uh, but Dan is working on another project right now, and he's kind of it's time crunched a little bit. So I'm pretty happy Rob was here today though, because yeah, Rob, had Dan, did a great we've job. had Dan before, but we have not had Rob on the stream. So I thank, thanks it. for participating. Yeah, coming on last minute. Um, thank you both. That's quite quite a lot and if you've been watching with us from the beginning thank you so much for sticking around um, there's a lot of content here to digest we're well aware of that 
Um, oh, I forgot Jimmy. Freaking Jimmy. Freaking Jimmy. I knew I was forgetting somebody. <laughs> well, you mentioned Jimmy earlier. I did I mention Jimmy earlier. Thing. Sorry. I can't, Working but I, well, how, we're talking about it's my okay. team. Just Sorry. Keep, just I knew keep, I was forgetting somebody. I'm giving you permission to keep interrupting me so that we can make sure. So I just want to say Jimmy is a lot, like he has like tons of experience and he's awesome. He came from Coalition, AAA programmer, tons of wise experience, and he's been great on the team. I just want to highlight Jimmy. Sorry. I totally forgot Jimmy. Continue, Victor. I'm letting you know, though. Please. I would prefer if you are able to mention all of them rather than, you know, I just every week. It's 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 okay. Um, but, and if you are curious about something that we discussed, maybe you joined later on in the stream and you're not sure what we talked about earlier, um, for the YouTube VOD, we timestamp um, most of the video, so not down to the questions per se, but we do sort of the general beats of the live stream. Uh, we also provide a full transcript of the entire live stream, uh, which is manually authored for accuracy. Oh you can gosh. download that uh -oh. PDF. <laughs> you didn't notice? I think I, I didn't know that. <laughs> last time, last time it was close to three hours as well. And yeah, Wait, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna do something. I have a, I have a three-year-old banana all right so i just want to see that in the transcript right it's now it's going to be there so <laughs> if you want to find a particular search term and wonder when we talked about it you can go control f in that pdf file and search for banana, banana. and there will be a timestamp <laughs> there will be more than one now <laughs> now there's two all right and 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 okay i'm about to say it again it's like that first episode of loki <laughs> i should point out that, that there's an automated this. process as first and then we make sure that it's met uh, then we manually go through the transcript to make sure it's accurate shout out to our captioneer, uh, as I like to call them, uh, Corey, uh, Courtney, who is um, doing all of that work for us every week. I feel really oh. bad for them. This. Was... <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're getting paid overtime. Aaron is their worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> they see the plan, uh, the content planning document, and they go, "All right, let's schedule some extra overtime." For I need it. to get some coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Either way, that file will be available in the YouTube description, um, usually within seven days, maybe a couple of extra, depending on um, how long this one will take for yeah. them. But this it is, is a very problem. long. I can't believe how long this has been. I apologize. The You're still not a record, though. The record <laughs> is held for the um, Cold Symmetry and the Mortal Shell live stream. Uh, oh, my they're, gosh. They're still holding the record. Um, but it's it's been a pleasure, though, so it's great to have you. I know everyone out there is happy to see you as well. And like you said, you know, it might be even a year until we get audio back on the live stream. So yeah. I did tell gotta, you, gotta get take it all the opportunity. In now. Yeah, take the opportunity. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> We're live. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good to have you. Um, that said, I'm going to try to wrap this up now as long as possible. But if you're excited about the new tools that Aaron and Rob have been showing us today, you can go ahead and download the U5 uh, early access version of the engine from the Epic Games launcher. Uh, or you can access the uh, both the early access branch on GitHub as well as the, the main branch that we are working on um, in which you'll see commits that we do to our internal master branch only a couple of hours usually or within, within that window uh, they're live on GitHub. And so some of the things that Rob was showing off uh, are not available in the early access version on the launcher, correct? Correct. But you can go ahead and get them in the main branch on GitHub soon, because I think Aaron mentioned that they were not submitted yet. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And the same goes for future developments until 5.0 is out there. Um, and with that said, next week we got Mike Beach and Michael Nolan coming on to talk about awesome. game feature plugins. And that will actually be the wrap up of all of the UE5 related live streams that we've done in this batch, not this year. That's definitely not going to be the case because I already have a couple more booked. But uh, from here on, from that point on forward, we will be going back and forth a little bit between uh, UE4 features because we do have 427 right around the corner uh, coming out, and there are some really new cool features shipping in 427 that didn't make it into UE5 early access, and vice versa. Um, a little bit back and forth, but we're going to try to cover as much as we can. Uh, and so, with that said, uh, thank you, uh, Aaron and Rob. And chat, please give it up for Aaron and Rob who came on today. Um, did a long spiel, um, which <laughs> that's good. That's what we were expected. I know the team behind the scenes here are also just like, all right, all right. It's Aaron's time here. for lunch. Wrap it's this up. <laughs> lunch? It's five dinner for you. Yeah, go for to dinner. It's yeah. two hours my, lunch. My wife's I'm called really, three times sorry. already. So. I'm really sorry. We should have had like lights going. Anyways, I probably missed like two other meetings I was supposed to Start to, playing so. the Oscars like walk off music. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one last question since we just can't seem to wrap this up. Aaron, uh, who was wondering this? It was from Alex Gachanya, who, uh, wait, was it? No, it, it was from, hang on. Uh, no, 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 it was, from, it, it was from Not A Cool Name. Aaron, when are you releasing a song produced in Metasounds? <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe I'll put it to my SoundCloud. Check out my what, SoundCloud. It, it wouldn't be one sound, Shout it out. would be infinite sounds. Yeah, yeah, I'll just like public it. Play you know, differently. Exactly. Ooh, <laughs> oh, so, a, so actually, 
instead of a, a, a wave file, it would be an Unreal yeah, Engine Yeah, yeah, so it's binary. different every yeah. time. Yeah. Like, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah I right. like that. That's really cool. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're sound the same. Yeah. Brad says May. Boop, 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 boop. That's a great <laughs> That's pretty much how it is. All right. Thank you both. Right. It's been a pleasure. And for everyone out there, stay safe, and we'll see you again next week at the same time. See Take everybody. care, everyone. Bye. Take care.